this lecture will be Bezrat Hashem Lerfuat Itai Ben Margalit and the Shmira and Atzlacha of the soldiers in Gaza, Dror Menashe, Barak Chaim, Tzur Avraham, Bnei Chana Elisheva, Lerfua of Chaim Shmuel Ben Liba and the short to the family, Lerfua Bat Sheva Bat Menucha Mincia. And Lavdi Lilu Nishmat Munira Batchana. Tov. Bezrat Hashem, before I start uh, the lecture, I saw today some news that it mamash boils the blood. Uh, that, that, it, just, it doesn't just make you angry or upset or disappointed, and it mamash boils the blood. In Israel, as you all know, I've been speaking about it for 20 years at least, there is a bunch of wicked people, lefty liberals, haters of God, that are in control of everything. They control Israel from A to Z. Not 99%, 101%. There's now one thing that they don't control. It's very, very frustrating. Because these people are very, very evil, very wicked. They have a horrible ideology. They can't stand God or anything that relates to God. When they hear Torah, they become so negative. You can't even speak next to them. If they see someone enjoy their religion or praying or learning Torah, it drives them crazy. As results of that, with this big, huge tragedy that we are experiencing now, in the last month and a half almost, Hashem is doing something very, very clever, as, as usually. Oh, everything Hashem does is very, very brilliant. We could not tell until today which lefty Jew is Erev Rav and which lefty Jew is just an innocent fool that was fooled by others. It, it was not so possible to know. They all speak against religion, they all speak against the Israeli army, they all pro-Hamas, they all pro-gays, they all pro-everything God hates. And they all hate what God loves. So it's very hard to tell. Now, the left is split to two groups in the last month. Because most of the people that got killed in this uh, massacre are lefties. Most of the people the Hamas killed are lefty liberals. So the lefty liberals that survive, or their friends that are kidnapped, or family members, or friends that died, opened up their eyes. We've been giving our life to help Palestinians, to support Hamas. We, we were for giving them land for peace, we wanted to live next to them in peace, and now what happened? They came and murdered us after we gave our life for them, for decades. So what happened? No more hypocrisy. That's it. We're not going to be lefty liberals anymore. Gaza must be wiped out. We can live there until there would not be one building left. That's how they talk now. <laughs> Okay, better later than never. It took decades to open up their eyes. Without this tragedy, and it would take another 50 years for them to open up their eyes. Now when it's on their skin, they open up their eyes. But you'll be shocked, not all of them. Some of them continue to support Hamas. Now at least we know which lefty was just a naive fool that was blinded by the media and by the other Erev Rav, and which lefty is 100% Erev Rav, that has no way to fix them. This Erev Rav, it's cancer in the heart of the Jewish nation from the time Moshe took them out of Egypt. 3,300 years, they eat our heart always betray us, always cooperate with our enemies, and they have inside them a part of Amalek, this kind of Erev Rav. Among them, 
is the woman, Imach Shima Vizichra, a thousand times Imach Shima Vizichra. She's one of the biggest enemy of the Jewish nation in the world today. And uh, uh, she's the attorney general. She basically kidnapped Israel now, together with her friends in the Supreme Court. She makes all the decision, what you're allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say, what the prime minister can say, what he can do, what he cannot do. So right away, all she cares about that these murderers who shot and raped people and burned them alive and put babies inside the microwave and turned it on, that they get rights. That's what she cares about. She can sleep at night that some of these terrorists now are being held in jail, too many in a room, or things like that. It drives, it drives her crazy. You know, so guess what? In Israel there is a rabbi that everyone loves. Everyone loves him. Why? You can see he's a pure, very good person. Very good person. There's nothing evil about him, not even a drop. His name is Rav Grossman from Migdal Haemek. He has yeshiva, he has institutions, he's an older man, and probably close to his 80 already. He was a candidate to be the chief rabbi, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel. He has, he's endorsed by the richest people in the world. They help them to develop the city of Migdal Haemek, to buy a lot of apartments for his Baalei Tshuva people. He's a, he used to go to bars, speak to secular people, get them out, bringing them closer to the Torah. His approach is the softest approach. He's not the type to speak Musar or to rebuke. He does it with love, with hugging, you know, this, this style of Kiruv. Okay. So therefore, the secular people, 99% of them, they love him. He's not a threat to them. He doesn't speak Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat. What's waiting for you in the next world or anything like that? That's not this type. His style is just to hug and to compliment and to try to show people the, you know, the greatness of Judaism without being harsh. Let's, you got the point? For those of you who do not know who he is. So today, this attorney general in Machshima ordered the Israeli police to call him for an investigation. To call him for an investigation. They're going to investigate this, this righteous man. What? What's the crime he allegedly committed? I'll give you a hundred guesses. You will never guess. In your wildest dream, you will never guess. Even if I tell you that they did such a thing in Nazi Germany before the Holocaust, you would not believe. You wouldn't believe it. But in Israel it happened today. Do you know what they want to investigate him for? For coming to give a speech to a group of soldiers somewhere before they went to the battle and did Shema Israel with them. Do you understand what I just said or no? For a rabbi to say Shema Israel with soldiers, they want to prosecute him. They want him to have a criminal record. Do you understand who control Israel? Please don't ever forget this. Our enemies are them, not the Hamas. The Hamas are the contractors for them. They activate the Hamas. People like Bernie Sanders and his friends. But in Israel you have people that Bernie Sanders compared to them is a tzaddik. The people that control Israel, Bernie Sanders is a righty compared to them. This communist, self-hated Jew, Bernie Sanders, he is a righty compared to those lefties. That's how wicked they are. Aaron Barak and this attorney general and many of those lawyers who work in the prosecution, it drives them crazy to see anything that smells like Jewish. Nothing, they can't take it. They can't take it. They already announced a week ago that they are following and monitoring all the soldiers and the generals who gave motivation speech to their soldiers before they got to risk their life. And many of them died, unfortunately. Some of those soldiers didn't come back. 
So they are monitoring and recording and keep record of every general that spoke words of Torah to his soldiers before they went to the battle. That once the war will be over, they will prosecute them. Do you understand what country we live in? Now people are asking why such a horrible tragedy happened in Israel. The tragedy, if you ask me, one of the reasons, there could be thousands of reasons, and we don't know for sure. I wish we would know. We don't have prophets today to tell us exactly. But we are allowed to guess. It's not a crime to guess. It's actually an obligation to guess. If you are a God-fearing person, everything that happens around you in the world, you immediately have to search for the hand of God, for God's fingerprints in what just happened. Why did he allow it to happen? Why did we hear this person say such a thing? Why did we have so many casualties? Everything that happens, for good and for bad, we have to immediately try to think why God is doing it to me or to them or to all of us. That's the way we have to look at the world. A believer can never take anything for granted as an act of nature, as a random thing or coincidence. We know, we spoke about it thousands of times. So if I have to guess, my, me personally, based on everything I learned over the years, one of the reasons that Hashem is very angry at us is because we left those traders alone. We could have put an end to them. We had the power, we are the majority. All we needed to do is to tell them, get, we catch you and throw you out of Israel to Gaza. Take this attorney general, put her in a trunk, drive her to the border and dump her. Just like that. On the other side of, don't dare to ever come back to Israel, you traitor. You're lucky we don't put you in jail for life. You betray your nation because of you soldiers are dying every day. Because of you terrorists get strength to come and shoot kids and to rape them. You are the reason. And few thousands of your friends who are in charge of every courtroom. Yesterday in Queens I said about this judge, Imach Shimo, another lefty liberal from Tel Aviv, who refused to start a Zoom meeting in a court, because now you know he can't come physically to the court because of the situation. He did not agree to start the case until they removed the Israeli flag and the sign, Am Israel Chai. He refused to start. You don't get the point. I know it's hard to understand what I'm telling you. Imagine a judge in United States court anywhere in America that say, I refuse to start until you remove the American flag and the sign that we have, long live America. You have a sign in a courtroom, let's say, and an American flag, and the liberal judge refused to... Here in America, you also have liberals. A lot of the judges are Democrats. But I won't believe that a Democratic judge, lefty liberals, will say, I refuse to start until you remove the American flag from the courtroom yeah. or from the police station. Police station. They have, uh, they have criminals. The judge has to speak to them and to their lawyer on a Zoom. And behind the criminals, you have the Israeli flag and long live Israel. He said, what does it have to do with our case? They said, we want to give our uh, people, workers, uh, comfort. A lot of the friends died here. So we hope that the Jewish nation will not die here today. I mean, long live Israel. You an Israeli? You a judge? Or you a Hamas terrorist? What are you? In case you think that this judge is the only one, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Almost every one of them in Israel is like this garbage. Almost every judge. And that's now you understand what the Gemara said, that one of the conditions before Hashem will bring the, Masha, the Mashiach, the Messiah, is to get rid of all the wicked judges, that finally there will be some justice in the land. Because lack of justice and such corruption, that's one of the reasons for all the tragedies. The Gemara brings a list of things that brings tragedies to the Jewish nation and to the Holy Land. Gay parades, abomination, laws of Sodom, act of Sodoms. 
and traders. Traders. You know, one of the most righteous, legendary kings in the history of the Jewish nation was King Hiskia. He's right there on the top with King David. It's hard to tell who was higher, King Hiskiao or King David. Both were extraordinary. In the time of King Hiskiao, you didn't have a child that was not a Talmud Chacham. Every kid on the street was a greater than any rabbi you know today. Kids, six years old. He forced the entire Jewish nation to learn Torah. He actually declared someone who would not learn Torah will be stabbed to death, will get execution. The king is above the law. For instance, the Torah doesn't say to kill thieves. If someone stole, according to the Torah, he has to return what he stole, and he has a penalty. You stole a thousand, you pay an extra thousand. It's knas. Sanhedrin can rule a knas. Today we don't even have Sanhedrin, we don't even have the kefel, the knas. But in general, you don't get a death penalty for being a thief. But if the king got angry already, too many thieves, and he wants to put an end to it, he can declare, the next thief that we will catch, I will chop his head off. Why? Let's see if anyone would dare to steal ever again. People get scared. Who wants to get his head chopped off? or to execute him in any other way. So if they caught a thief and they found him guilty, after my warning, you, stay, you still stole, the king can kill him. But it's not what the Torah said to do to thieves. Yeah. But the, the, the king is above the law. So the king, Hizkiyahu, there's no death penalty for someone that does not learn Torah. In the next world, there's going to be a severe punishment for not learning Torah. Because Hashem even agreed sometimes to forgive the worst three sins in the Torah, Gilui Arayot, Shfichud Damim, and Avodah Zarah, meaning sex crimes, the most severe sex crimes, which some of them have death penalty, and idol worshipping, and murder. Gilui Arayot, Shfichud Damim, and Avodah Zarah. Those three, a person has to die and not to agree to commit. So as bad as the sin is, there is a situation that if a person repents and does what needs to be done, Hashem is willing to forgive even those horrible sins. It's not easy, but it's possible. But the Torah said that there's one thing Hashem refused to forgive, is Bitul Torah. Vitera Kadosh Barchual, Shloshet Averot, Gilu Arayot, Shfichut Damim, Vavodah Zara, Velo Vitera Al Bitul Torah. Refuse, refuse to forgive people that disrespect the Torah and don't care and don't learn. Just like limut Torah keneged kulam, learning Torah is greater than anything. Not learning Torah is worse than anything. Okay, so we get the point. So King Hizkiyahu, when his father died, what do you think he did to his father? What do you, when a person's father dies, what, what does he do? He raped his clothes. It is funeral. He can't even put fill in until the dead is buried. He can't take shower, you know, meat, wine, all these mourning laws. Can't hear music for one year. Can I go to weddings, parties? There's a lot of restrictions to yeah. someone who mourns his parents. Yeah, Wait, wait, we didn't get to it yet. Yes. So, obviously when a person's father dies or mother, there's laws of mourning, how you should mourn them. So, if, imagine someone's father died, not only he did not, he doesn't see Shiva, he takes haircut, he shaves his beard as usual, he listens to music and make a party. Why are you making a party? You got dressed nice. You fix your beard, had a nice haircut. Ma, your father just died two hours ago. He was just buried. He's supposed to, go to mourn. So what's the law? Someone that rebelled against God, you don't see Shiva on him. You get dressed nicely, the Rambam writes, and that's the law in Shulchan Aruch, and you rejoice. Rejoice. What do you mean? It's his father. Father, brother, mother wicked, anti-God person, 
There is no obligation to mourn them. You eat well, you dress well, and you make a party. Did you ever know that? Why today we don't do it? Did you ever hear about someone in Israel or in America that his parent died as wicked as he was? Halal Shabbat, thief, idol worshiper, Jews for JC, all these horrible, wicked people. I didn't hear ever that their family made a party. Assuming he has a re religious son, Baal Tshuva, and his father is a very wicked uh, gangster or something. Did you ever hear that instead of sitting Shiva and people come to the house, he makes a party with some good music and gives some barbecue? Why are you so happy? My wicked father died. Did you ever see such thing? Usually, I don't, I don't think it's, anyone has the guts to do it. But I'm just telling you what the law is. But nowhere, nowhere you hear that someone will tie his father with a rope to a horse and will drag to the tail of the horse and will drag his body all over town when people standing and watching. There's one thing you don't mourn. You take shower, you fix your beard, you listen to music, you don't see chiva, you go to work as usual, okay, you don't mourn. There is one more level, not only not to mourn, but at the same time to rejoice. That's already a higher level. And there is a, even a higher level than that is to do such thing, to tie the body to a horse and drag him in, in, on the streets of the town. Who would do such thing to his father? The answer, King Chizkiyahu, perhaps the most righteous king in the history of Israel. No one, no one made the Jewish nation so righteous like in his days. That's what the Torah says. So why would he do such thing to his father? The answer, because his father was a lefty liberal trader. Traders, that's what you have to do to them, Hashem says. There's, no, there's a difference between wicked person that died and a wicked person that was also a trader that will decide to join the enemy and help them. <coughs> Not only fighting against God, joining the enemies, like Neture Karta, these fools, standing in Manhattan with Palestinian flag two days after they butchered 12 of 1,300 Jewish kids and girls and women and old people and Holocaust survivors. How do they not have a shame to show their face in public holding the, the filthy flag of those Nazis? There's one thing you hate, the Zionist, the communist, the wicked people who came to Israel and made kibbutzim and moshavim fighting the religion. We also are obligated to hate them. People who goes against God, people who wants to destroy and burn the Torah, you must hate them. The Torah is not double face. The Torah doesn't, cannot stand hypocrisy. You have to love the righteous and you have to hate the wicked. Unless the wicked have no idea what they are doing. Meaning they raise them in Siberia. They don't even know they're Jewish. No circumcision. No, they don't know what Shabbat is. They don't even know anything. Okay, that's a different story. That's called Tinok Shenishba. But if they know there is a God, they know there is such a thing Torah, they know there is such a word Shabbat, a special day, they don't know the laws, but they heard about it. They see people living according to this Torah. They see religious people everywhere. They're already guilty. Why? Why didn't you come to investigate? You see thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people with yamaka and tzitzit and beards and all that. And they have strict laws and they live by a book. They don't move an inch left and right. All around you, cousins, friends, neighbors. Colleagues at work, you see people pray at your office, Mincha, Shachrit. You see in the airport, religious people stand on the side and pray, or in the airplane. Where were you seven years? You didn't care to check what these Jews are doing? Maybe I live in a lie? I gave you a brain and intelligence to use it. You didn't use it, you are 100% guilty. If you're born in uh, Uganda, or Zimbabwe, or in the Caribbean, or in Siberia, and you never saw Jews in your life, 
Your father had you over there, and then someone kidnapped you, and that's it. You grew up with non-Jews, and you don't have any idea. Okay, so you're not guilty. Anus Rachmana Patre, someone that is not guilty, Hashem has mercy on him. He had no way to know he's a Jew. You get the point. But the father of King Chizkiyahu was not someone who didn't know. He knew God. Everyone in those days were religious. He dragged his father's body in the middle of town. Why am I telling you all of that? Not that I'm suggesting that we should do it to the traders. No. It's a different world today. We don't have Sanhedrin. We don't have king. We cannot make up rules, even though those were the rules in those days and people actually did it. Today, you cannot do anything before you ask a big rabbi. You have to ask a big chacham, because sometimes even what's allowed doesn't pay to do it. Sometimes, if you're going to do what's, what the halacha says right now, the damage you can cause to the Jewish nation sometimes can be so bad, you know? So if that's the case, you, you will, we would lose a lot more than what we gain. That's why you need to ask a chacham. You know, sometimes it's better not to talk. Sometimes you must talk. You need to know. Sometimes when you talk, you lose more than you gain. So we have to know, Rabotai, there's so many laws and there are so many things that are sensitive. You have to know what to do. So this is what's happening. They take a rabbi close to 80 years old that all his life tried to bring Jews to Judaism to do nice things, nice to so many people, help so many people. You can see in his personality. There's really nothing bad about him. That's why nobody, nobody hates him. The secular, I'm talking the secular people, if there is a strict rabbi, some of them hates him because he tells them the truth in their face. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear what the Torah says about Michalel Shabbat or a gay or a thief or an idol worshiper. They don't want to hear it. When you tell them the truth, they get angry. But him, since he always speak to them only positive and hug them and, you know, didn't, didn't create enemies. But the Erev Rav doesn't matter how righteous you are. It doesn't matter how much you kiss up to them. And he was nice even to them, believe me, even to them. He was sometimes on TV shows. You know, he was too nice to them. And what happened? Now he fell in, his, in their hands. Sometimes you try to do something in order for you to bring people, maybe not to hate the religion, to open up their heart. But we have, we, we, I'm talking about myself and everyone else, we have to know to draw the line. How far we are willing to go and compromise with the wicked because we want to bring them closer to the Torah. Because we have a rule. It's a solid rule. Everyone will tell you that rule. You don't have permission to lower the Torah to the level of the wicked people in order for them to love the Torah. You have permission to raise the wicked people from their low level to the level of the Torah. Find a way. There are many ways. One will do it in a strict way. One will do it in a soft way. One will speak mainly about emuna. All kinds of things. One way to make people buy the tshuva is to pay the money. Come, I'll pay you for every hour you come to learn in yeshiva. I'll pay you money. If you're rich, you have a cousin. He's Mechalel Shabbat. So you know what? Every day you come learn one hour, I don't know, I'll give you $100. You can afford it. Five, six days he comes. He begins to fall in love with the Torah. Then he says, you don't have to pay me. I mean, I enjoy. You have to pay me? No, I don't want to take. Thank you very much. You saved him. He's starting to learn. A year or two later, you don't recognize him already. There are many ways to do Kiruv. You can argue which one are more productive and which one are less productive. But one thing the Torah say, there is no permission to compromise with the truth of God to any wicked person. There's no such thing. Okay, you know what? For now you can do this. Do, okay, if you do this, okay, I will allow you to do that as well. No, no, no. Hafez Chaim, he was on the way to 
to a city and he had to stop in a motel. You know, in those days he had the horses and this. Sometimes it's snowing, you have to stop in a motel. The motel had Jews and non-Jews, you know. So now the Hafez Chaim met over there a Jew, secular Jew. This was close to 100 years ago. Started to talk to him about Judaism. And that Jew was on the way to a trading parade, a, a, a weekend, you know, one of those shows that people bring their merchandise to sell. And the show is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, just like today. And the Hafez Chaim said to him, do you know about Shabbat, the importance of Shabbat? You want to go do business on Shabbat? Hafez Chaim explained to him the whole thing about Shabbat. And this Jew, he said to the Hafez Chaim, wow, I didn't know all these things. I promise you, Rabbi, that I will become Shomer Shabbos, but not from this Shabbat, from the next one. Because now I already arrived all the way to the town. I bought my merchandise. I must sell it. I paid for the, for the, for the fare. So Rabbi, just allow me this Shabbat, and that's it. I won't make ever plans to do business on Shabbat. I'll keep Shabbat the right way. Wouldn't you be so happy? What an achievement. No, yalla. He already he didn't keep thousands of Shabbatot in his life, or hundreds. What's another one? in order for him from now on to be Shomer Shabbat for the rest of his life, let's compromise. Yalla, okay, deal. Break this Shabbat, and from next Shabbat, you give me a word. You would be very honored. Wow, I made Baal Tshuva, no? But the Chafetz Chaim, he, he was straight like a ruler. He said to him, if I was the master of Shabbat, I was the partner of God to the system, to the to the laws of the Torah, then it would be up to me to allow you. But since <laughs> I do not own the Shabbat, the Shabbat belongs to Hashem. It's a covenant that Hashem made with us. We don't have permission to violate Shabbat even one more time. How will I allow to do it to you? Similar, by the way, to a person that is a mass murderer, serial killer. Every day he kills someone. And now, he brought to justice, and the king said to him, I'm willing to make a deal with you. If you promise me you'll never kill anyone, I would let you off the hook. You can go back and live your life. But I need you to give me a word that you won't kill another person. And this person said to the king, no problem, I'm giving you my word, but I have one more person to kill. <laughs> one more person, after that, no more killing. <coughs> Can the king agree to such a deal? No. <laughs> now what's worse? Killing someone or breaking Shabbat? According to the Torah, not according to New York Times. <laughs> according to the Torah, what crime is bigger in the eyes of God? I didn't write the Torah. Don't blame me. Okay? So, in case you're getting angry, the address is over there. www.divine. Speak to Hashem. Ask him why it's so severe to break Shabbat in your eyes, even worse than a murder. Why are you giving a bigger punishment to a violator of Shabbat than to someone who just killed someone? Why there are all the restrictions that apply to a Mechalel Shabbat, almost none of them apply to a murderer. For instance, a murderer that is Shomer Shabbos is still a Jew. Mechalel Shabbat, that is the nicest person, definitely not a murderer, loses Jewish identity. What makes you Jewish? You were born to a Jewish mother and you are Shomer Shabbat. If you were born to a non-Jewish mother, nothing will help you. You're not Jewish. That's it. Even if you keep Shabbat, you're still not Jewish. But if you're born to a Jewish mother, it's not enough. You need one more condition to make you Jewish. What is it? You must be fully observant of the Sabbath. That's the, the ticket to allow you in. What is it like? You have two doors to enter to the bank to get your money from the safe. Outside and another door. If you only enter one and you are now between the two doors, but you don't have the other key for the indoor. <laughs> what is it going to help you? You're stuck between the two doors. You can still not enter and get uh, access to your money. You need 
two conditions, like double password. You know how Google, they have two passwords? Okay. One is not enough. You have double uh, identification over there. So the same thing over here. Just that your mother is Jewish, okay, you're born with a Jewish neshama, Jewish soul. But in order to activate it and to be a Jew, a Jewish status, and have a share to the world to come, and goes to where the righteous Jews go, you must be a Shomer Shabbat, observant of the Sabbath, and most Jews are not aware of it. They don't even know it. They know there is such a thing, Shabbat. They know that according to Judaism, you have to be Shomer Shabbat. They know many people that are Shomer Shabbat, brothers, friends, cousins, neighbors, you know. But they don't know that to break Shabbat is actually worse crime in the eyes of God than someone who killed someone. They don't know that. Why they don't know it? Because between me and you, how many speakers you know? Can you name to me at least 500 speakers? If you go on Google, you have thousands of speakers. How many of them say what you just heard? I just said. Tell me, name to me, besides Rabbi Ruven and maybe another two, three rabbis. If I bring you now a thousand speakers, any one of them ever say it? Now what I say, it's true or false? True. If it's false, I don't deserve to speak. I'm making up my own religion. But that's the law in Shulchan Aruch. I'm sure that by now you know that I don't make up things, no? So if that's the law in a Jewish book of law, so who's right? Someone who caught the law or someone who ignored the law? Some people, they just don't want to say the law. Why people get upset? Let's reach out to them in a different way, without telling them what God thinks about them. After we'll be able to make them balei tshuva, they'll go to yeshiva, they'll find out what does it mean to be mechalel Shabbat. Let's not right away hit them with this uh, shocking news. I can live with that. Okay. You want to do it the longer way? Fine, do it the longer way. But there are some who don't have any shame. Not only they don't present the law, when I asked about it, they completely lie. No, God forbid. It's not true. Who told you such a thing? God loves you as you are. If you only know how much he loves you, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. The Rambam say the opposite. Shulchan Aruch say the opposite. The Gemara say the opposite. And the five books of Moshe say the opposite. So where did you bring up your nonsense from? From his hunch. I don't know. He's a, it's called Svarata Keres. He likes to kiss up to that Mechalel Shabbat. Sometimes he may do it because he has good intention. But again, he's breaking the law now. Because you're not allowed to modify the truth of God just to find favors in the eyes of a wicked person in order for you to bring him to the Torah. So you bring the law, the, the law of the Torah as low as possible for him to like it. You know, today it's very much in style everywhere, Israel, here, to do davening with guitar, drums bringing all kinds of speakers. Just today in Washington, they had this uh, Nets Minyan. It's not the first time. They bring singers, they play nice guitar, all these beautiful melodies. They sing the Alel, more than half an hour, people dancing with the tefillin. Very inspiring. Why do you have to do it? Why do you have to do it? Do they do it in yeshivot, in serious yeshivot? They bring guitar and drums? No. But in places of modern people, it became a fashion now. Almost everywhere you see it. Why? Because the level of the people is so low, how will you attract them to come at six in the morning to pray in Rosh Chodesh for more than two hours? How you, how you offer them a good breakfast, with good coffee and lax and I don't know, cakes and all kinds of good drinks and l'chaim and great music and lots of people and you choose a place that has a wonderful view 
The White House is a different story, but usually they do it by the lake, by, you know, you know in the marina, in nature. Why? To attract people. Why you have to do all these gimmicks? Because the generation is in the lowest level you can imagine. So you have to find all kinds of tricks to attract them. Is that kosher or not? No. The answer is yes, as long as you don't break the laws. There is no law against it. Yep. I mean, yes, in a synagogue, some say you're not supposed to play music inside shul. It's not a party place. But if you do it outside, okay. So the, the question is now, to come play guitar and violin and some drums in the middle of Alel and sing to God how much we love him and praise him, do we break any law? No. If it attracts another 50 people to come, and now maybe there is a chance they're going to start coming every day to shul, right, after the inspiration they had in Rosh Chodesh, why not? If we will offer people ice cream, kids, teenagers, they don't want to come to shul. If you come, I'll buy you a whole box of great ice cream. Oh, yeah? I'm coming. Once, twice, three times you buy them ice cream, then they don't, you don't need to give them ice cream. That's it. They got used to come. Any gimmick that does not violate the rules of the Torah, it's blessed. Why? You have to match yourself to the low level of the people. But again, without changing the laws of the Torah, without modifying the laws of the Torah, make no mistake, you're not allowed to allow something that is against halacha, even against rabbinical law. You're not allowed to say, okay, that's only rabbinical, let it go. No, 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 not allowed. Anyone who compromises on the truth of God, what the Torah and Halacha requires, will not have blessing in his Kiruv world. It may look that he works for a while, but that person will not have blessing in what he does. Why? Because Hashem said not to do it this way. My Torah is not, don't make a mockery out of my Torah. Right? One time I was in San Diego, this is the last thing, and then we move on to our topic tonight. When I was in San Diego, I don't know, 15 years ago, in a very big, nice, big place with a great yard, had a lot of people, 150 people maybe, sitting in the backyard. The weather there is great, you know how it is. And I spoke about the restriction of coming to the synagogue with the car on Shabbat. Not to come. Why? Because someone told me before the lecture, there are people here, they come to shul every Shabbat, but they drive with a car. So as I'm saying it, one guy got up. Back then he was probably 60 years old, 65 maybe. He had kids. And he said to me, I disagree. I disagree. What do you mean you disagree? You should come to shul with a car on Shabbat. What's the alternative? I drive for, I, I live 40 minutes away from the minyan, from the shul. The only time my kids see a synagogue and hear the reading of the Torah and maybe a 10 minute speech from the rabbi is on Shabbat. And there's no way for me to walk to the synagogue. So what are you saying? I shouldn't drive my kids into the shul? That I won't have any connection to the synagogue? I'm sure that God is happy that we drive to the synagogue on Shabbat. I'm sure you heard that thousands of times, this claim, right? There is any logic in this claim or no? Let's be honest. There's any logic? A little logic. For an ignorant person, there is a lot of logic in it. Someone who never read the Torah and never read Halakha, it makes a lot of sense. What's the purpose of shul? The Jews gather together to praise God, pray, and make the request. And to hear the reading of the Torah. So, we want to do something positive. We're not driving to the beach. We're driving to the house of God, to the shul. So, if we cannot come by, by feet, so we might as well drive. So that's his claim. So then I say to him, 
I want to ask you a question. When God gave the Torah, did he know the future? He said yes. This is not a heretic person. We're not dealing with someone that tried to make a mockery out of the Torah. It's someone who is looking for convenience. Allow me. I want to come to do something good. So I say, when God gave the Torah, did he know the future? He say, yes. Did he know every Jew that will be born in the future? Yeah. Did he know all the shuls in the world and every generation, what's going to happen and not going to happen? He say, yes. I say, when God gave the Torah and the laws of the Sabbath, he gave us one exception to the rule. One. Life risk. And nothing else. If a life of a person is in risk, man, woman, child, anyone, you're allowed to temporarily violate the laws of Shabbat to save their life. Today, to drive them to the hospital, or to make a phone call to Atzala, 911, or anything. Or to take your own car and drive him to the hospital. Or to heat up water because he's freezing to death now. If you're not going to put some hot water with a sponge on him, in five minutes he'll be dead. He fell, snow fell on him. By the time we move the snow, he's about to die. So we're allowed to heat up water. Maybe if we can heat him up or turn the oven on or something to save his life. Mm -hmm. That's also a violation of Shabbat. So there are many ways to violate Shabbat, and all of them are permitted in order for us to save a person from death. Even if there is only 1% chance that he will die. 99% that nothing will happen to him. He has fever, 103. Most people that have 103, they don't die. Not even one out of 100 would die, or one out of 500. But there is a tiny chance that he may die, you're allowed to break Shabbat. Once the life risk is over, you are not allowed to continue violating Shabbat another second. You cannot do anything. Your car is on. You're not allowed to put it off. You're not allowed to close the door. Why? The light will go off. You shut the engine. It's not allowed on Shabbat. You already arrived to the hospital. You open the door, you took your son out, and you run into the emergency room. The doctors took him over with the bed. Now you want to go move your car. You're not allowed. Why? It's a $200,000 car. Someone will get in and, and steal it. There's no permission to break Shabbat to save money or to save a damage, financial damage, even if it's a trillion dollar damage. You have a building that worth in Manhattan, a billion dollars. There are buildings like this in Manhattan. In good area, I don't know, 50 floors with thousands of apartments. It's over a billion dollars, the building. And fire starts. Today we're allowed to put the fire off because there's life risk. People on the top floor, they may die. But let's assume that this building is vacant. The government, the city gave an order, you must vacant the place for a month until you fix something in a building. So there's nobody there. And now fire started on Shabbat. A billion dollars will go down the drain. You're not allowed to put the fire off. You're allowed to call a goy to put it off, if there is a goy. But if there's no goy, you just lost a billion dollars. No permission to violate Shabbat once to save a billion dollars. Life risk? Yes. Someone is in a, some person stay there in a, in a penthouse, I don't know. By the time he's going to come down, the fire is going to choke him. He's not going to be able to come out. That gave you permission? to violate Shabbat. So I said to that guy in San Diego, Hashem knew there will be Jews that live so far from the synagogue, and they won't be able to join together to pray. And the only time they'll be able to come to a synagogue is to break Shabbat. And he did not make a second exception to the rule. In order for people to gather together on Shabbat and pray in Minyan, I give permission to violate Shabbat, just like I gave permission to violate Shabbat for a life risk. Life risk, permitted. Praying together in a synagogue, permitted. There's no such thing. If it was more important than Shabbat, then Hashem 
will allow it. But you see that Hashem did not allow it, knowing there will be thousands of Jews in every generation who because of that will never see the, sh the synagogue. Never. Because not everyone lives next to the synagogue. And he sat down, and that was the end of the argument. Because he knew. So you see, it's logical before you use your head. Once you begin to use your head, it's a very easy legal case to prove that you are wrong. Why? Hashem knew the future, no question about it. He knew there will be people that cannot come to the synagogue, absolutely. And he didn't give permission to break Shabbat for it. That means pray at home. Aye, but it's boring to be alone without all the chevre, without the chulent, without the kiddush, without the speech of the rabbi, without the reading of the Torah. You can't even answer Kaddish, Baruch Hu. You, you miss a lot when you pray home. It's not the same. There's nothing to compare. The answer is move next to the synagogue. You know, one of the conditions when Gentiles wants to convert, it's not enough that they learn the book Welcome to Judaism by heart. Even if they know the entire book by heart, which technically they are ready for conversion, the Bedin will not convert them until they know for sure that they live close to an Orthodox synagogue. Anywhere. Kosher Shul, not God forbid reform or conservative, that's worse than churches. We're talking about a Kosher Shul. Rabbi, the rabbi knows you, go introduce yourself, say that you are in a process of converting. And once they know that the person is starting to go to shul, to pray, then he gets fill in, you know, and he's starting to change his Goish lifestyle to a Jewish lifestyle. Once they see that he's in already, they're willing to convert him. How will they convert him if he lives in uh, Zimbabwe? Where exactly is going to pray? Where is he going to get kosher food? Who is going to be his rabbi when he has questions? Do you get the point or no? Person isolated without a community, it's impossible to stay religious. You need yeshiva. You need a place for your children to learn. You need a rabbi in a place. And you also need friends. Tomorrow we have a problem. Who is going to run to help you? The community is all like a brotherhood. It's not only in Judaism. In every religion, even all those fake religions, they have communities. Why? Because it's simple common sense. You be alone on the moon. I want to be tzaddik on the moon. Not exactly possible. Tomorrow you'll have a child. Who's going to circumcise him? You're going to get a spaceship to, to the Moel? I arrange for you a flight to the moon. The question is, do we have to keep mitzvot on the moon? If there was a possibility to live on the moon today, we have to keep the mitzvot on the moon or no? Why not? We that. On the moon, you have gravity or no? Yeah. You don't have gravity, you fly. <laughs> if you fly, how exactly are you going to daven shliach tzibur? Stand, Hashem sfatai tiftach, your head is into the ceiling. Or the whole synagogue will fly in the air. Now you want to eat matzah, your child is sitting at the table, you hold the matzah, the matzah stays in the air, you hit the matzah, and your son is going to open his mouth and he's going to fly him into his mouth. There's only one problem, guess what's going to happen when you have to go to the bathroom and sit down there. <laughs> and you know, the waste is refused to go down. It begins to fly in the room. It's a little bit hard to be religious in those places. Plus, we have to check about the dates, daylight, night. Even in Scandinavia, you can't be a Jew. In the North Pole, in Finland, in places like this. Six months, you have light. And then six months, darkness. If you have a child, you're, you're supposed to, to circumcise him in a light. Not at night. But the night is six months. So imagine now, if you have to circumcise your son in the eight day, meaning it has to be day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night, eight times. How many years will it be? Four years. By the time eight days will pass, it's basically four years, like this calendar. 
You get the point or not? It will be a little bit difficult. When is going to be Sof Zman Kriyat Shema? When is going to be Chatzot? There's a lot of mitzvot you're not allowed to do. For instance, tefillin. You have to put in the daylight, not at night. But it's six-month night. What are you going to do? Put tefillin in the middle of the night? Do you get the point or no? A Jew cannot live in those places. From here we see that when Hashem gave us the Torah, the Torah is designed to begin with for Jews to live in certain places, not in every continent. Some places it's impossible to follow the rules. Well, how are you going to know? Now Kriyat Shema ends at 8.30. 8.33, this morning it was, 8.34. What are you going to do in Scandinavia? Even in Europe it's very hard to be a Jew. I was in Belgium, 11 o'clock, it was still night. I mean day. It's Motsi Shabbos, 11 o'clock at night, it's still light outside. Now imagine Friday night, you want to pray and do Kabbalat Shabbat, pray Arvit, go home and do a meal. By the time it gets dark, it's 11.30 at night. By the time you get home, by the time you do Kiddush, by the time you finish the meal, it's 2 a.m. 2 a.m. <laughs> and your kids, it's, it's problematic. But in the Middle East, it's perfect. In the Holy Land, even here in America, we are lucky that the goyim change the clock. You know, there's a lot of arguments about changing the clock. If the goyim will not change the clock, do you know when, when would be Sofzman Kriyat Shema? 9.35. 9.35. You know when it will be sunrise? Almost 8 a.m. 8 a.m., meaning quarter to 8, it's still dark. So only you can start praying around 7.30, 7.40, until you get to the Tefillat Shemona Yisrael, it becomes sunrise, 8 a.m. By the time you finish the davening, until you get to work, it will be almost 10. Now, Baruch Hashem, they bring the time back. That extra hour allows you to be at, at your office at 9 a.m. Otherwise, it will be a disaster. Same thing in Israel. Also, they're fighting not to change the time. But Baruch Hashem, in Israel, the religious people sit in the government. So they make conditions. You want to be with us in the government? These are one of the conditions, conditions that we need you to follow. And Baruch Hashem. So let's move on. Yesterday, the last thing I spoke about, speaking about the parasha we read on Shabbat, parashat Chayel Sarah, that Sarah passed, Avraham made a eulogy for her, and Avraham refused to cry for her until after he buried her. Usually the way it goes, when someone dies, you first cry immediately, because it's an instant reaction, right? If you just found out your best friend or relative or husband, wife, spouse, child, someone died, you can't control. You begin to cry, to scream, you faint. All this reaction, it's normal. So Avram is coming back from the Akedah. He was ready to sacrifice his only son to Hashem. Hashem said, no, don't do it. Avram said, I came all the way here. Let me at least make one line of blood that at least some of the mitzvah I care. Hashem said, don't do it. Now I know you're a God-fearing person. Ten times you tested me. But now you got the stamp. You officially welcome to the VIP of the holiest people in the history of the world. Together with Isaac, Jacob, King David, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and a few other hundreds. It's a, it's a special club. Amram, Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron. People that became legend. That's it. The whole world knows about them. The, their Torah will remain forever. So, Rabotai, Avraham arrives to his house, and what does he find out? That while he was willing to sacrifice the most precious thing in his life, with no question asked, and no thoughts even against Hashem, his wife just died. So, okay, what's the problem of crying? It's a normal reaction. 
Hashem doesn't get angry at someone that cried that his wife just died, right? Mm -hmm. It's no restriction not to cry. The opposite. Hashem understands that now it's the time to cry. It's even written in the Torah that the whole nation of Israel cry for Aaron for 30 days. There are proofs in the Tanakh that it's mitzvah to cry when someone dies, especially a big tzaddik. So why Abraham refused to cry? Because if he would cry, all the people that look up to him as the messenger of God in a generation, like a phone say to him, you are the president of God among us. Nasi Elohim ata betochenu. We look at you as a messenger of God, the Goim. Everyone looks at Abraham like that's the, the, the representative of God. If he will cry now, he would look like he's regretting the mitzvah of the Akedah. I mean, it looks like I should have not taken Yitzchak because of that I lost my wife. So in order for him not to do Chilul Hashem, that the Goim will see weakness in him, which they can translate as he's regretting now what he just did in the Moriah mountain, he did not have one drop of tear until after he buried Sarah. That's when he made the eulogy. But usually the way is, first you cry, and then later you do the eulogy, after you buried. So that's where I ended up yesterday. Now I want to continue the best stuff I left for today. We're going to learn a lesson for life about dating. Finding your soulmate. For you, for your children, for your friends. Tov. Everyone is busy now trying to do matchmaking. That's the crisis of the generation. Everybody understand. The whole world is in crisis. Jews, non-Jews. More and more older people cannot get married. Millions. Many millions of people. <coughs> quality people. Nice looking people. Smart people. Religious people. Wealthy people or someone that has everything, the whole package, or she, or he. It looks like some kind of a curse. A large portion of the communities cannot marry their children. I had a few lectures about the Shidduch crisis. That's not the topic here today. Today I want to focus more on what's happening with Abraham sending his servant Eliezer, one of the most righteous Gentiles in the history of the world. I want to remind you, there are 10 people who went to heaven with their bodies. They were not buried. There's a list of them. One of them is Eliezer. In case you were wondering how righteous he is or not. He comes from a cursed nation named nation of Canaan. Noah cursed his grandson Canaan, the son of Ham. So the nation is cursed forever. They cannot remove the curse of Noah. But it doesn't mean that a cursed goy cannot be righteous. As long as he has a curse on him because he comes from that race that is cursed. But being righteous is a matter of will. You want to be righteous or not? You're working hard to be righteous or not? No one is forcing you to be wicked or to be righteous. It's 100% in your hand, like the Rambam writes in Ilchot Shuvah. Now let's see what Abraham said to his servant. Go and find a wife to my son, to my son, Yitzchak. But how are you going to find a wife? I want to warn you in advance. Let's see. Vayomer elav, Abraham said to Eliezer, I want you to go and find a, wa a wife to my son. Put your hands under my tie and swear in the name of God, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not take a wife to my son from the nation of Canaan, meaning your nation. Eliezer is Canaani, he's from Canaan. He said to him, make sure you do not bring my son any girl from your nation. Do not bring. Even though we sit and live among them, I want you to go to my original place of birth and you bring a wife to my son Yitzchak from there. 
סו רבותיי, why Abraham is sending Eliezer so far to find a wife? What's the problem? What, in all land of Canaan you cannot find one good girl? Not that in another place there is any righteous girls. Then Nevela Zetrefa. In the end, who did he get? Rivka comes from the worst house. Her father is a murderer, Betuel, and her brother is the biggest crook on earth, ever. He took advantage on Yaakov for 20 years. Idol worshiper crook. So what kind of a bargain he found? Rivka herself is extremely holy and righteous. But what house she grew up in? The world's house. Same thing Avraham. What house did he grow in? His father was an idol worshiper selling idols to the public. Avraham didn't born in Bnei Brak or in Mea Sharim or in Lakewood. Where did he grow up? Avraham. In a house of Bernie Sanders. Father, Baruch Hashem, Terach at least made, uh, made tshuva in the end of his life for the honor of Avraham. Such a legendary holy tzaddik and his father will go to hell. I don't want to upset my son Abraham. I have to help to make sure his father will repent. So his father repented. And what was his end? He died. And what happened to his father, Terach? He had to come back again in reincarnation to pay for all his idol worshipping sins. Even though he repented. He left it. He dumped the idols. He asked for forgiveness. What we call tshuva. That wasn't enough. If you influence the public to do wicked things, to become wicked, to act wicked, to behave wicked, as much as you repent, it's very hard to overcome the negative you left in the world. Because how many good things you can do as an indiv individual? You do one good thing and at the same time all your students continue with their idol worshippings. You're going in reverse. Hashem sent him back in reincarnation. Who was he in his next life? Iov. Job. The book of Job. That's Terach. How much he suffered, all his children died, all his money went, sicknesses, all his friends turned their back on him. Terrible. All of that for the past life. And he was very righteous in the next life. He was a messenger of God. He wasn't a Jew, by the way. Terach died as a Goy. And he also was born as a Goy. Abraham became an Hebrew, meaning he came out of his Goish lifestyle and became the first Hebrew. And after that, later on, Judaism started in Mount Sinai. So let's see Rabotai. He's warning him, do not get a woman from the land of Canaan. Go to the place of my birth, and from there, find a girl with kindness, with good traits, good personality. This Canaanim, do not have good traits. Their mentality is not good. Make sure don't, to, no, don't find a girl over there. Top. Then we continue. You know. Why does he have to say this language? It says, Lebni Leitzchak. It's like two individuals here. And you took a wife to my son, to Yitzchak. No, you should have said, and you should get a wife to my son, Yitzchak. That's the proper language. You don't have to say two twice. To my son, to Yitzchak. It's like two sons. Do you get the point or no? This is a divine language here. Mm -hmm. There's no place for errors. Why, do the, why did Hashem use this language, meaning Avraham used this language, find a wife to my son, to my son, so there's one two, to Yitzchak. Find a wife to my son Yitzchak, or to my son, that's it. We know who we're talking about, I have only one son. The answer is, it's not enough you find a wife to my son. 
That's the general order, the mission, to find Shidduch to my son. No. But there is another mission. The wife that you're going to find have to be the right, exactly the right wife for my son, Yitzchak. Yitzchak is not like me. I am the symbol of chesed. Avraham is the symbol of kindness. Yaakov is the symbol of emet, Torah. Yoshev Ishtam Yoshev Oalim. Yitzchak is judgment, strict judgment. That's the truth and that's it. No mercy. Strict judgment. To live with a person that is only strict judgment, mitat adin, it's not easy. You need a wife to balance his judgment traits. It's very judgmental. To be judgmental is a positive thing or a negative thing? The answer, it's a very positive thing. You must be judgmental. If someone is risky and look fishy, you have to be extra careful. If you have a gun, get ready. He may turn around and attack you any minute. Why? <laughs> because this kind of person usually attacks, the way he dresses, the way he looks, or the area where I am. It's a dangerous place. Record shows a lot of people got mugged there especially middle of the night. Why are you so judgmental? Because you have to be judgmental, otherwise you'll be dead, don't be a fool. If someone bang on your door at 3 a.m., you have to assume it's some Nazi anti semite who came to kill you. Yeah. Try to break the wall. Don't be judgmental. Maybe the poor person is about to die from hunger. Maybe. But there's a much higher chance someone came to kill me. Or there could be a tragedy also. Someone needs a ride to the hospital. I don't know, something happened by the neighbor. It could be many things. I have to go down with my, my, with my gun. Why you brought the gun? I'm your neighbor. Why? Because I have to be alert. Bottom line, you must be judgmental. But you cannot be only judgmental. Only judgment is not good. Only mercy is not good. It has to be a balance. You have to know when to be in judgment, and when to be in mercy. Only mercy, it's a disaster. Only judgment, it's a disaster. A combination, it's wonderful. Avraham knows that Yitzhak is midat adin, is strict. He must have a wife that will balance him, will ease him, don't rush, breathe. <laughs> Calm down, my dear husband. <laughs> yes, you're 100% right. That's the law. That's what needs to be done. But let's mix a little bit mercy. You know? Find a wife to my son. That's the general rule. But now I'm giving you a more specific rule. Which wife? A wife that will match someone that is midat adin. Okay, tov. We learn one more thing now. Then, Eliezer answers something very clever. What does he say? Vayomer elav ha'eved. And the servants say back to him, Ulay lo tove ha'isha lalechet acharai. Maybe the girl would not agree to follow me. To leave her place and to come all the way to here. El ha'aretz azot. She won't agree to come. Let's see what Rashi says. How did he write? It's written in the Prophet Hosea, chapter twelve. Knan beyadom mozne mirmal hashok zav. Knan has scales in his hand to cheat. And steal gold. When you weigh the gold in 47th Street, you have to make sure you go to a righteous, kosher person. That he doesn't trick you with the weight. One ounce he put. You put all your gold over there. Okay, you, one ounce, 1.1 .1 ounce. Pays you for the gold. 
If it's a crook, it says on it one ounce, but it's three quarter of an ounce. See, it says one ounce. This is two ounces weight. This is uh, one pound. This is a hundred gram, you know. People used to cheat. They have one over here, which is a kosher weight, and one in a pocket. The Torah says if you have it in your pocket, it's already a sin from the Torah. No less than eating pork. But I never used it. The fact that you already put a fake, fake uh, weight inside your pocket, meaning ready to cheat the customer when he doesn't look to switch when he turns around and he looks, you know, someone just spoke to him, you switch quickly. Even though you never dare to use that, every second it was in your pocket is a sin from the Torah. We're going to get into it soon. So Rabotai, Knan ze Eliezer, the Midrash Rabba says, Knan, it's this servant Eliezer, he came from Knan. שהיה יושב ומשכיל את ביתו ראויה או אינה ראויה, אליעזר is debating. Should I offer Abraham to take my wife as a shiduch to his son Yitzchak or no? I have a great wife. She's righteous. Not, not wife, daughter, sorry. Eliezer has a daughter. Eliezer has a righteous daughter. What can be better? I gave you my life, Abraham. I take care of all your businesses, all the arrangements, all the money. You took me together to fight and release Lot from Sodom and from, from, from Nimrod. I'm willing to risk my life for you. You count on me with your eyes closed. And now you even count on me to go find your, your son, uh, Shiduch. Meaning there's no observations here. How about we become family? We are like brothers. Let's do shiduch to your son, to my daughter. What's wrong with my daughter? She's a great girl. She finished Bet Yaakov for Goyot. <laughs> there was no Jews yet. So there was Bet Yaakov for the Goyim, for the righteous Gentiles. <laughs> the Eliezer is debating, should I offer or not? Why is debating? Because Abraham doesn't know he has a daughter. Why Abraham didn't suggest that? Eliezer would be dancing to marry his daughter to Yitzchak. It's better than winning the lottery. But since Abraham doesn't suggest it, should I even offer it or no? It's good. It's a valid point or no? Let's see. If it's a valid point, tell me why the Midrash call him a crook. A crook that deceived with the scales. Remember, we are talking now about one of the most righteous Gentiles in the history of the world. Most of the Jews you know today don't reach 5% of his level. <laughs> they don't go to heaven with their body, to the best of my knowledge. So he's definitely a righteous person, Eliezer, with a stem from Hashem. So why the Midrash said that now when he's thinking about should I offer my daughter to Yitzchak, it's considered an act of deceiving. Like deceiving with a scale. Why is it? Soon, soon you're getting the point. Now we're going to something very deep and very crucial to understand for every minute of our life. I'm going to teach you now one of the most important foundations in life. As I always tell you, every sentence in the Torah, it's a school for life. People read the Torah like they read newspaper or some romance. It's nothing to do with that. It's 100% book of instructions. Right now we need, we're learning Jewish Ashkafa, a divine ideology. What's right and what's wrong. What to do, what not to do. How to behave in certain scenarios. We're going to understand that in a minute. So Rabotai, Eliezer is debating, my daughter is worthy or not? He's about to kidnap, meaning to deceive, to steal, to steal gold. What gold? Yitzchak is the gold. He's thinking, should I steal Yitzchak for my daughter or not? Tov. So he said to Avraham, maybe the girl that you're sending me now to your family over there, maybe she won't agree to come. 
What would we do then? Meaning he's, he's trying to push his daughter into the picture. Okay. Meaning Eliezer understands that the first priority for Abraham is not to marry his daughter. Otherwise, he wouldn't send him. The fact that he said, go over there and find me a girl from there, knowing that he has a daughter across the street, and he doesn't suggest that she do, you don't have to be a genius to understand that it's not his top priority. So what do you do? You say, but what happens if I won't be able to find? Meaning I found, but she doesn't want to come. She doesn't want to move from LA to New York, Rabbi. It's too cold over there. We, the Persian of LA, we love LA. I don't want to move to Great Neck. Tov, maybe we'll move to LA. No, Moshe, you move to LA? No, Rabbi, our business is here in Manhattan. What will I do in LA? Weather is nice. Weather doesn't give put uh, food on the table. Tov, no shiduch. Two lovely Persian boys and girls. Why they don't get married? Los Angeles and New York. That's the common problem. So Eliezer has a good point, no? She doesn't want to come, maybe. She won't agree to move, to relocate. You know, in a shiduch profile, they write, willing to relocate. <laughs> well, I already know this question would rise. Tov. Rabotai, it's sweeter than honey. Listen to this. And Av Avraham, he said, what happened if she won't agree to come? Avraham already read his mind. And he said to him, I'm very sorry, my dear servant Eliezer. There is a rule by God. Someone that is blessed spiritually is not allowed to get married to someone that is cursed spiritually. Blessed and cursed cannot merge together. Who is cursed? The nation of Canaan. Who cursed them? Their grandfather, Noah. Why Noah cursed Canaan? Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yefet. Ham had four sons, Mitzrayim, Egypt, Put, Kush, and Canaan. Canaan was the youngest one, fourth one. He is the one who saw his grandfather naked, drunk, after he drank wine, laying in the bed, called his father Ham, they castrated, castrated uh, Noah, made him unable to have more kids. And then when Noah woke up and saw what happened to him in his body, he cursed Knan. What Knan? Cursed Ham. Ham is the one who did it. But Knan was the one who went and called him. Mm -hmm. So because you made me unable to have a fourth child, I'm going to curse your fourth child that is already alive. He's alive, I cannot kill him. But I'll put a curse on him. What's the curse? He will always be a servant. No matter where, they're always going to be slaves. Today, by the way, you still have slavery in the world. It's not like it used to be before Abraham Lincoln, right? People used to have no rights. Today, there's modern day slavery. They get $4 a day and work 16 hours a day. I don't know, in India, Thailand, Tibet, China, all day, or diamond, blood diamond, all day they look. There are rules, you know, you, can, you have to know that the diamonds are kosher, why? If they took advantage on African kids and tortured them for a dollar a day or a dollar a week, I don't know exactly how much they pay them, in order for rich diamond dealers here in America to make millions of those diamonds, these diamonds are called blood diamonds. Meaning like diamonds that came uh, in a war crime, such a, something like that. So Rabotai, he said to him, I'm very sorry, I will take your daughter, but God blessed me. I'm blessed, and you are cursed. My son is blessed, your daughter is cursed. Not personally, in general. You cannot mix between a blessed nation and a cursed nation. End of story. Tov? No, seder. Let's move on. Now, Rabotai, Chazal are talking negative about Eliezer, knowing that he went to heaven with his body without burial. Make no mistake, they know the level of Eliezer. But that's what's beautiful about our religion. 
They are criticism against everyone, no matter how holy they are, no matter how righteous and divine they are. When they did one thing, tiny thing, that it's incorrect, boom, right away attack. King David attacks. King Solomon attacks. Moshe Rabbeinu attacks. Abraham attacks. Yaakov attack. Noah attack. Why? The Torah said they're righteous, all these people. But they did one or two or three things that were incorrect in their entire life. Let go! Shove it under the rug! Will you ever see one negative word against Muhammad ever in the last 1400 years in Islam? No. Find a book that said that Muhammad was a pedophile. They'll burn you and your book. Say that he was a murderer. He murdered people who didn't want to accept him. You already have a problem. One word you say against Muhammad and your life is in risk forever. Like Salman Rushdie, you heard about him? Mm -hmm. He wrote a book against Islam. 25 years, I think, he was hiding until a few months ago. Somebody spilled acid on his face. Made him deaf or blind or something like that. They didn't forget him after 25 years. He was living in a in Gaza, in an underground tunnel. He came out of the tunnel after 25 years. Tunnel in, in New York, probably. I don't know where his tunnel was, bunker. And immediately they got him. The one time he came out, boom, in public. Meaning they did not forget 25 years. Why? You insulted the prophet. If someone would write criticism against Muhammad in the Quran, at least we would know that there is a chance the book is divine. The fact that the entire book is perfect and it never did anything wrong and there's not one negative word about him, you know it's the, the book is fake. Same thing about JC. Any criticism against JC, JC, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Holy JC? Never. Why? Because the whole book is fake. Goes to the Torah. Adam, criticism. Everyone, criticism. Noah. You should have saved your generation. You were not righteous in other generations. Why? Why do, you, why do you go out of your way to make Noah look questionable? Why are you talking against Esav? He's the son of, uh, of Yitzchak. Come on, he comes from the royal family. Don't talk about him. Why do you have to say that he's hunter? And that he's Hashem uh, Rasha. He wants to murder his son. Shove it under the rug. Who needs to know that? The answer is, when it's a divine book, it must be 100% authentic, based on what really happened. And that's what we are doing now. Hazal, our sages, knowing Eliezer is one of the greatest people in the world, are now criticizing him. For what purpose? To make him look bad? Absolutely not. To teach everyone after that even the greatest people in the history have weaknesses, and you should learn from their experience. And that's a very strong, very strong point. Chazal, they say Eliezer was not objective. Every person that have a personal interest, it clogged his judgment. Personal interest, clog your judgment. It's direct danger to fair judgment. You, not that you're lying, you cannot see the situation objectively. You get a phone call from the yeshiva, your son has a, had a fight with another kid. We need you to come. You don't even know the details. It cannot be. It's probably the other kid attacked my son, I know him. If they would tell you, Rabbi, Reuven had a fight with Shimon, they're not your kids, in yeshiva. Okay, tell me the details, I tell you who is guilty. Now you can see it objectively. You don't take one side, because it's nothing to do with you, it's no personal interest. Here first you think, wow, they're gonna throw my son out of yeshiva, what will I do? Fear of such a situation immediately make you go against the truth. But you're not a liar, you're a holy man. Rabbi, come on, how do you behave like that? It happened to Eliezer, it can happen to the rabbi as well. So now, listen what the Gemara said. The Chachamim said, 
אליעזר את נגיעות, נגיעות, meaning personal interest. That's why the Midrash Rabbah is telling us that Eliezer deceived with a scale. On a scale, one side he was, should I offer my daughter to Yitzchak? The other side of the scale, should I not offer? It's not sure. What's the question? Avram told you go over there and why, what are you saying? Maybe the girl will not come with me. It's a wishful thinking. He's hoping that he won't be able to find. But the claim that he made, it's true or not? Absolutely. So where is the lie? Now we learn a very important foundation for life. You can say the truth 100% while you're connected to a lie detector and you are a full crook in the eyes of Hashem. A full crook. 100% a crook. Why? What I said, it's 100% a possibility. It's a legit, legitimate possibility. Absolutely, what you say, it's not the problem. Is why you say it. Why you say the truth now. Meaning it's not enough just to speak true or false. We have to know why you say what you say. Meaning, if you are a politician or not. When a, when a European politician come to Israel and then go to Gaza, they do it. When he comes to Israel, it's unbearable how much you're suffering from this terrorist, Palestinian Hamas, shame on them, shooting rockets on innocent civilians. This has to stop. Did he say the truth? 100%. Then he crosses the border, goes to Gaza. What does he say? The Israelis, shame on them. How long it's going to go on like this? Assuming he describes on both sides things that really happen. How do we know if he's righteous or wicked? The answer is, why does he say what he say? Why does, why does he go to the Hamas? and tell them it's unbearable what the Israelis do. Why, what for, what, what is the point? He wants to get another 10 million Arabs to vote for him in the election. That's why all these fake Hollywood stars, most of them wants to choose the Arab side. Why, how many Jewish followers we gonna have? 10, 15 million in the whole world, there's 15 million Jews. But if we're going to take Palestinian side, right there we have over a billion and a half fans. Fans is money. Yeah. Is billion people on Twitter, I don't know, those social media. How many Jews can go on my uh, Facebook page? Maximum 15 million. That's it. How many Arabs will go? Arabs, Afghani, Iranian. Palestinian, Kuwaiti, Bahrain, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Bangladesh, Yemen, Libya, Egypt. Look how many countries. I'll be the hero of one and a half billion Arabs. But they have a Nazi ideology. Is supporting Nazis just because you want them as a fan? Why do I care? I know they're Nazis. I know they want to slaughter all Jews. Every fool knows it. You have one guy in the world that doesn't know Arabs wants to slaughter all Jews. Everyone knows it. And the same people, the same people scream, you have to eliminate ISIS, wipe them out. So why? Because who were wiping ISIS? American. American together with the Arabs. Even Arabs wanted to get rid of ISIS. So to get rid of ISIS, everyone agree. To get rid of Al-Qaeda, everyone agree. To get rid of the Hamas, we cannot agree. Why? That's going to cause us a problem, because the other side are Jews. So Jews, first of all, most of us are anti-Semite. We hate the Jews just as much. And even if we don't hate the Jews, we have sympathy to them. But it's not good for business. It's not good for business. Why? Because... Who, who is going to buy our product? I sell a soccer shoe. If 
500 million Arabs will buy it. How many Israelis and American Jews will buy that sucker thing? How many? 200,000? 300,000? It all comes down to politics and business. Therefore, it doesn't really matter if your claim is correct or incorrect. What really counts in the eyes of God is why do you say it? For personal interest or for real objective search for the truth? In the end, on both cases, you say the truth. I give you an example. One of the most famous speakers today in the Jewish world, we, we were together in Yeshiva in Monsi 25, 27 years ago. We were both learning, students. After being more than two years together, or two and a half years together, we were learning every day there, he decided to make Aliyah to Israel. Why? Because that rabbi was born religious. He was religious until age 17, something like that. He went off the derech, not fully. Stayed a little bit traditional, but he wasn't like a Bachur Yeshiva anymore. He met his uh, girlfriend at that time, which today is his wife. And they got married. I'm trying to remember, no, he got married after, no, first he was in Yeshiva, and then he got married. Okay, he came to Monsi to the Yeshiva. After being in Yeshiva for a while, the rabbi over there saw right away that he knows Gemara from the days he was in Yeshiva. He was in Yeshiva from age four. From age four until age 16, he will learn a lot of Gemara, you know, Alachot. He was a student. Unlike others who came with no, no, no knowledge and starting at age 20. So when he came to the Yeshiva, I believe he was 21, 22, 23, something like that. We were at that age, around that age. He already had a lot of knowledge from his days as a child. Mm -hmm. So immediately he was able to teach the beginners. Because he already knew how to learn Gemara. So the rabbi over there found a free tutor. He doesn't have to pay him a salary because in one hand he's one of the students in yeshiva. He lives there, he eats there, he learns there. And while he's there, he teaches the new people who comes. What can be better for him? It saves him around $1,500 at that time. It was like a few thousand dollars today. So one time, that, that student decided to make aliyah. Why? Because the level of the yeshiva he wanted to go to in Israel was much higher level. Because he already wanted to go in to be a dayan or to be somebody more serious in the Torah world. So he came to him to the manager there, the Rosh Yeshiva. He wasn't Rosh Yeshiva there. He, was, he, he considered, but he it was almost never there. But he ran the Yeshiva there. So he said to him, I decided to make Aliyah. And he started to attack him. Who told you that? What makes you think you now ready to make Aliyah to Israel? Do you know what a strong Yetzer Hara you have in Israel? What makes you think you're going to stay religious there? There's a lot of challenges, ch challenges. What's wrong for you here? You have a holy place, everyone religious, no temptation, no issues with family and friends that are not so observant. Technically, everything he told him was true. There's more challenges in Tel Aviv, or whenever he lived in south of Tel Aviv, Drom Tel Aviv. It's not exactly Monsi, <laughs> when it comes to a holy environment. Will he have more challenges in Israel? True. Everything he told him was true. He didn't come and say to him, oh, this and that, made up some stories. But the only reason he gave him that speech wasn't because he was worried about his soul. Not at all. He was worried about his pocket. If you leave, I'm going to have to hire a new rabbi and pay him a salary. Mm, it will cost me a lot more. Right now, I have you for free. Baruch Hashem, I heard about it, and immediately I took him to the side. I said, don't listen to him. Go. Go right away. Don't waste your time here. Baruch Hashem, he went and became somebody important. So this is a perfect example. If now you would take that person and connect him to a lie detector and say to him, did you lie to that rabbi? Oh, he wasn't a rabbi back then. When you told them all the things you told them, 
Did you actually lie? Absolutely not. You told him there are challenges in Israel. 100%, there are. You told him it's not such a holy environment where his family live compared to Monsi. Absolutely right. You told him a lot of things. Everything I told him is the truth. I didn't make up stories. Of course. So technically, you're a liar or not? We have to judge you now in court. You liar or not? Technically not. The answer, absolutely. A crook. You are a crook. Why? Because Hashem knows what's the reasons you're trying to prevent him from living. And none of the things you say, that's the real reason. None of the things you say, it's the real reason. So, technically, Rabotai, almost all of us are like this. You have to reach a very high level, because if Eliezer was like this, who are we not to be like this? It's called in Hebrew, interessantim. Interessant, it comes from an, um, an, from an English word, interest, personal interest. All of us has our agenda. In English, there's a word for it. What's in it for me? Everything in the end, he tried to turn it around to benefit him. Do you understand or no? The Gemara says, Kohen Gadol is not allowed to marry a widow. Regular Kohen can marry a widow. You cannot marry a divorcee. No Kohen can marry a divorced woman. But a regular Kohen can marry a widow. The husband died. He's allowed to marry a Kohen. But Kohen Gadol, the one who became the main Kohen, who goes into Kodesh HaKodeshim, into, in Yom Kippur, in Bet HaMikdash, <laughs> is not allowed to marry a widow. What's wrong with marry a widow? The answer is nothing. Nothing is wrong with that. So why the Kohen Gadol is not allowed and other Kohanim are allowed? Yesterday wasn't Kohen Gadol. He was allowed to marry a widow. Now he became Kohen Gadol, break the Shiduch. You cannot get married. The answer is, Rabota, you're going to be falling from your chairs now. You're talking about the holiest person in the world that goes into the holy of holy to speak to Hashem. Because maybe he liked that married woman. She's so beautiful. She's so smart, charming. But she belongs to another man. He may go into Kodesh HaKodeshim and ask Hashem to kill her husband that she become free for him. And the power of the prayers inside Kodesh HaKodeshim, it's a killer. It's a killer. It's so powerful that chas v'shalom, maybe her husband will really die from his prayers. Because that he has a personal agenda, a personal interest to get, to get this woman, and right now he can't, or he may pray, he may not pray directly that Hashem will kill her husband. No one will, no one will do such thing. But what will he do? Hashem, please, I'm begging you, I want to marry this woman. How can you marry her? She's married to someone else. You will arrange it. I'm not telling you what to do. But I'm counting on you to know. You always know how to arrange things. Do you understand what's happening here? We are talking about the holiest person in the world that the entire nation is depending on his mouth. And he may like a married woman, and because of that, his personal interest can twist his mind to do a horrible thing. Can you believe it? Also, the Kohanim, they cannot sit in a bed in to make a leap here. You know, every, every two to three years, you have to push another month into the calendar, like this year. Adar Aleph, Adar Bet. When Passover falls too short, around March, it's too cold in Israel. It's not spring yet. Every two to three years, it happens. You push another month, Adar Bet, you postpone Pesach to around April, when it's already blooming and warm and nice. 
But Kohen should not be in a bed din to decide if this year we push a month or not. It's questionable. We can wait for next year. But his interest is to push another month into the calendar. Why? Because when he goes into the mikveh, it's freezing around March. He wants to push it a month later. That the holiday will be warmer. They doesn't have to freeze, or they walk with barefoot on the floor. The floor is freezing. Stone. So because he's trying to arrange himself a warm climate, environment, is not reliable. His subconscious will twist his ruling. So after I gave you an example from the holy Eliezer and from the holy Kohen Gadol and from Kohanim that serves in the house of God, you understand that we cannot be the dirt of the toes of their feet when we compare ourselves to them. So if by them it's possible, by us, it's needless to say, a million times needless to say, that not only it's possible, it happens by us all the time. By them it's possible. It may happen once or twice in a lifetime. It may. It may not. By us it happens every minute. Every minute. That's why when I speak in my lectures against smoking cigarettes, I say it's, it's so from the Torah. The Torah says you have to watch your health. You're not allowed to damage your health in any possible way. Something that damage the lung, the heart. Cigarettes bring tons of diseases and problems. It's already been proven. There's no more arguments about it. Who always argue with me? Only the heavy smokers. Never in history a non-smoker try to make an argument with me. Those who don't smoke, we support you, Rabbi. Go! You're too lenient. Go, far, go harder on them. Give them a smack, wake them up. All of us suffering from them, they make smoke everywhere, we can't breathe. And who argue? The smoker. Oh, you're too extreme, fanatic. They told me about you, you're too extreme. Don't bring him next time. I one time went to LA, to a Shabbaton, with hundreds of people, very big synagogue. The person who arranged the Shabbaton, he told me there will be one billionaire in a crowd. He pays for everything here. This shul, have donation, don't have donation, doesn't matter. Whatever they need, he covers. He has 150, 150 stores. I'm not going to say what kind of stores, because then you will know who I'm talking about. It's a famous company. So he told me he's going to be sitting right in front of you first row. This is your chance. If he would like you, he's a very generous person. He makes millions of dollars every month. What is he going to do with all this money? He shares. <laughs> Some people collect the millions hoping to take it to the next world to use it. Maybe in heaven they buy ice cream. <laughs> You know, a nice Rolex maybe they buy in heaven. Maybe. They may need it. But he told me that's your chance. Make sure he likes you. I will make you sit with him after the lecture. Everything you want, he will give you. I asked him, is he religious? <laughs> he told me traditional. <laughs> Meaning not Shomer Shabbat. Comes with a card. But no one dared to talk to, the, to his majesty. <laughs> Who is going to dare to get the lion angry? He pays all the bills. So now I'm sitting to myself thinking, what should I do? Should I kiss up to him? And maybe he's going to start giving tons of money and we we'll save thousands of souls? Oh, should I tell him the truth in the face? Because no one else will. That's now or never. I gave such a strong lecture about Mechalelei Shabbat. <laughs> the worst you ever heard. 
I saw while he's sitting there, if he could slaughter me, he could, he would. He's dying. But he's not dying because he just found out what's waiting for him in the next world. No, that wasn't his concern. He was dying from the audacity that I had to insult him in public. I mean, everyone there knows he drives on Shabbat. That means he was sitting over there thinking, what's my community now is thinking about me? Until now I was the king here. This guy came and made me nothing. Spoke about me like I'm some kind of a non-Jew. Not Shomer Shabbat, have no shirt to the world to come. Cannot be a part of a minyan, you're not allowed to give him aliyah. I, I, it's my opinion. It's what written in Shulchan Aruch. I just read it. So the guy that organized the Shabbaton came to me after the lecture. He said to me, Rabbi, everyone here was extremely inspired, except one. <laughs> the one that I told you, make sure you find favor in his eyes. First thing he said to me, don't dare to ever bring him over here. Of course, I never went there again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a not, that's not an easy test. What's the big deal? You kiss up to someone for an hour and a half, and he becomes your friend, and you start giving money, and we do kiruv, and slowly, slowly, I make him religious. Two, three, four weeks later. Allowed or not allowed? Or right now, you must say the truth. Who's to say, first of all, he will agree to give? Not everyone has the merit to give to kiruv. If you see that you are able to give money to Kiruv and it doesn't kill you, that's a sign that Hashem loves you. Because most people, they'll give to everything except Kiruv. Why? Because Hashem doesn't want to give them a million times more reward. Because every other mitzvah that you support is a one-time mitzvah. Even supporting people that sit and learn Torah you give them the money for one month, they learn one month, you have a share in one month. Next month you have to give them again money. What you gave last month doesn't apply to the following month. Following month you have to give them another monthly salary. They have to see, they have to feed their, their kids. So as long as you pay, you get. But Kirov, it's not like that. All you have to do is to, give, to put money, and with this money you create Baalei Tshuva. And they continue to produce mitzvot for you forever their children, grandchildren. You don't have to continue to give these people more money. All you have to do is to give them a USB, a book, this, that, and you get them into the app, and they, now they're following every day. And then a month later, they already shomer mitzvot, they come to yeshiva, they learn, they come to shul in the morning, they order new tefillin, which reminds me, I bought three handmade, 100% best tefillin on earth. They won't survive in my house another week or two. Those who need filin, take, take advantage on it. You can't find filin like this, because it's no machines, 100% handmade, no glue, best of air, unbelievable riding. And about a third of a price of the real value. Why? Because you bring it directly from the people that mix it with their hands. <laughs> Go to a store, store has to pay rent, workers, insurance, advertisement, tons of expenses, accounting, this. The store has to triple the price if they want to be in business. They have no choice. It's with all the expenses to be in business, taxes, this. So they have no choice. But when you bring it directly from the people, that's it. It's no five middlemen, this one and that one, and the owner and the employees. So anyway, Rabotai, the Kiruv is a one-time investment for that individual, and he may produce for you 50 years of millions of mitzvot every month. And all, in, all you need is that he'll go to yeshiva. And guess what? Every day, 600,000 mitzvot goes to your account, thanks to him. While you sit, listening to your beautiful music, eating your bagel in the morning, before you finish the bagel, you already made 20,000 mitzvot. Think about it. You're sitting now home eating a bagel with cream cheese. 
By the time you started to eat bagel until you do Birkat Amazon, 20,000 mitzvot you just made from one individual. One bal tshuva. Why? How long did it take you to eat the bagel? 20 minutes? 60,000 mitzvot an hour. 20 minutes is a third of an hour. 20,000 mitzvot. He's in yeshiva. You sit in your house eating the bagel, fressing. <laughs> Before you finish the bagel, you already made 20,000 times putting tefillin on. 20,000 times in 20 minutes. It's like put tefillin. It's mitzvah from the Torah. Again and again and again and again and again. Each time is a huge reward. Every letter of Torah, it's the most precious mitzvot in the eyes of Hashem. That's why very, very few people can actually give to Kiruv. Very few. My statistic, five out of a thousand. Five out of a thousand. What's the proof? We have 42,000 people on a YouTube page. 42,000 people. Every lecture goes 30, 40,000 views, minimum. And later on, it goes over 100,000 views. 40,000 people are watching, or 30,000, let's be safe, 30,000. How much they donate? Two people, three people. Go on YouTube and see. How many donations? 30,000 views, two donations, $1.99, $5, $9. Don't believe me, go and see. Logically, it should have been every person there donating minimum few dollars, five, ten, per lecture. Every lecture should have generated over $200,000 in a logical world. How is it possible that from 30, 40,000 people only two, three donates? The answer is no one has the merit. Hashem doesn't want to give that candy to everyone. Why? Because it's not just uh, one thing and it's over. It's a continuation, residual income forever and ever. And trust me when I tell you, I met over the years billionaires that are very generous people. They donate millions of dollars every year to a lot of different things. But when it came to Kiruv, I saw how Hashem did everything He could not to let them give money to Kiruv. Why? Because it wasn't their merit. That's why, because remember, it's a whole different concept. Every mitzvah is support. While the mitzvah has been done, you earn. Once it's over, you have to give again and again and again. You give food to poor family. They need $1,000 to feed their entire family for Shabbat, it's Friday and Saturday, whatever it is. Next Shabbat, you have to give them again a thousand. Otherwise, they want a food for Shabbat. The idea is that you want mitzvot? Okay, keep paying, paying, paying. But here it's a different story. With five, ten dollars, you can save a soul. And you don't have to ever bother with them. You don't even know them. They become religious from your money. You will only find out when you go to the next world. You're going to have the sweetest surprise. You're going to come to the bedding, to the court of heaven, shaking. You know yourself, and not exactly Babasali, you know? <laughs> Needless, the Lubavitch Rebbe, you're not exactly there yet. So, your Shabbos, barely. The way you dress, barely Jewish. Your ideology, barely Jewish. Your kosher food strictness, Hashem <laughs> Yerachem. Who knows how many worms you eat every day? Who knows? So if you really examine yourself, how you dive in, without speaking, without thinking about your business, without coming late, no. Let's say it needs some improvement. How you treat your wife and your children needs improvement. Your emuna in Hashem needs massive improvement. Your loyalty, your generosity. Well, I can give you a list of thousands of things. Your ego has to be reduced, no? Jealousy, laziness, stinginess, selfishness. Ooh, the Shonara. Wow, wow, wow. How many buildings fell because of your mouth? Bottom line, you now know, you finally remember all the lectures you heard in your life and all the books you read. You're now in the court of heaven. And you know, who knows how many years I'm going to need this hell to get. Who knows how much hell Hashem is going to give me now. 
You know who you are. Here in this world, you can fool the whole world, but now you are over there in the court of heaven, you know what's waiting for you. Because when you go to the court here in Manhattan, you always have a hope that you can fool the judge. <laughs> who is the judge? Another fool like you. <laughs> Whatever you tell him, he has to believe. Well, he doesn't have proofs. But when you know you came to the courthouse of Hashem, you're not that stupid. You can't fool him like you fooled the judge in downtown. So now you know what's coming for you. And after you hear the list of millions of problems that you had in your life, all of a sudden, what a great surprise. A defense attorney comes in, an angel, shalom. I came to speak on behalf of my defendant. No, he brings out a file, trillions of mitzvot. There has to be an error here. <laughs> it, that's not for me. Say, my client, Marshi. In Israel, they say, Marshi, meaning my client that I represent. Marshi also have a lot of positive things about him. Trillions of mitzvot. Moshe Cohen, Yitzhak Levi, Yitzhak Rosenberg. What's <laughs> Who are all these people? Monthly donation, recurring. 100, 200, 500 every month. Another two ballet tshuva, another one, another five. It adds up. 20 years, monthly donation. Only a few hundred a month from the master, which he obligates to give anyway. It's not that he's doing anyone a favor. 10% of what he makes from his net income is not his. He must give out. Keeping it is stealing it from Hashem. So anyway, you have to give. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Then all of a sudden he finds out he has three, four, five hundred ballet tshuva. I never met one of them. You know who to partner up with. Now you're coming to cash out on it. It doesn't mean he's not going to be punished for all his sins. But after he gets clean, what's waiting for him? Read in Chuvot al It was written a thousand years ago. Rabbeinu Bechaye that no one can reach the level of his person in the, in the next world, in heaven. No one, even prophets, cannot reach that level. Read his language. Filu anevi'im, ashlemim, the prophets of God, Ishaya, Yirmiya, Chagai, Yoel, Amos, all these holy prophets, cannot reach the level of someone that saved the lost children of Hashem and reconnected them to Hashem, what we call Kiruv. Remember the most important word in life, K-I-R-U-V. Don't ever ask me, how, how? How to spell it, Rabbi? <laughs> K-I-R-U-V, the key word to life of eternity, no joke. And by the way, you don't have to believe me. Ask anybody, any Talmud Chacham, what's written in Chovat al -Vavot. I think you have it in the internet even. If you know Hebrew, just Google it. Rabbeinu Bechaye on Ma'alat HaMachzirim B'Tshuva. Mezakeh Arabim. Inspiring the public to become more religious. What he writes, what the Gemara writes, what the Zohar, the Zohar, the Holy Zohar, it's in Parashat Truma. Parashat Truma in the Zohar. Read over there what it says. So since, Baruch Hashem, I didn't write the Torah. But to read, I know. That's all I can say. So I read to you some sources. I can give you 500 sources. The Ari, the Zohar, the Gemara in 50 different places. I think two or three sources is good enough for you, no? If you need more, contact me. I'll give you more sources. I have, a, you know, my black notebook. I have 10 pages over there with sources. It could be the other way around. You can make a person that was religious, not religious, now you have to pay for all the bad that came out of him and his children until the end of days. It works both ways. You can earn eternity in a higher level or chas v'shalom, eternity in a worse place. Why? You have to be judged based on the fruits of your action. Meshalem la'adam ke prima alalav. Fruits of his actions. Time is running out, Rabotai. I just want to finish this. 
So Eliezer say, maybe the woman will not want to follow me. Of course, every fool knows there is that opportunity. But because of this sentence, Eliezer was blamed to be a crook, deceiving in a scale. Why? Because the reason that he said the truth was politics. I think just for that it was voted for us to come tonight to learn this concept. Now I want to ask you a question. What's worse, to lie or to cheat with the scale, with the weight? Merame bamoznaim or shakran? It's written in the Torah in two different places. One place it says, midvar sheker tirchak. Go as far away as you can from lies, liars, you know. Of course, it's needless to say, you're not allowed to lie. Because even from other people that lie, Hashem say, run away from them. Needless to say that you, don't, you cannot lie. lie. But there's another verse. Lo tekachashu ish ba'amito. Do not deceive one each other. Velo tekachru, it's also written. Do not lie. In one place you say, stay away from lies or liars. And another place you say, do not lie. So it leaves no doubt. Also, it's written, Dover shkarim lo ikon leneged enai. Someone that speaks lies, I cannot stand him. Can look at him. I can look at him. Who can raise his hand today, right now, and say that today he did not say even one lie? You don't have to. I just made my point. <laughs> I want to promise you one thing. If we would accept on ourselves one mitzvah, one, and keep it, we will be the most righteous people in the world. What is that mitzvah? I accept on myself, no matter what, never to say a lie. Never. Give it a month, you become the Baba Sali. No exaggeration. It changed your entire life, your entire ideology, your entire level of holiness. You become a whole different person. But how difficult it is. <laughs> yeah, you just saw that even when you say the truth, you consider a liar. Because you have hidden agenda or hidden uh, personal interest. So I'm asking a question, a very good one. What's worse, to deceive with a scale? Or to say a lie. For instance, you have a customer, give me one kilo tomatoes. You have one weight of a thousand grams, it's a kilo. When she turned around, you switched it with 750 grams. Now you give her less. 25% you deceived her on a scale. Or you tell her, these tomatoes are not so fresh. This one is from today, this one is from three days ago, which is a lie, they bought from the same day. This one is 10 shekel a kilo, this one is 20 shekel a kilo, but it's from today, I just got it from the market, it's a lie. They bought from, from three years ago. <laughs> you know, like you go to the bagel store, is the tuna from today? Of course, you're insulting me. Do you know already a week is mixing it? Because if one or two hours you don't mix it, the top becomes brown. That's the trick. My, you're insulting me. Ah, but later he's going to get food poisoning. No problem, as long as he made the $10 on a bagel with tuna. So the question is, what's worse in the eyes of Hashem? Saying a lie and selling her the wrong merchandise by saying a lie, she believed it and she bought it, paying a lot more, or cheating with the scales. Which one is worse? All of you agree that the scales? Scales is worse? Okay, since all of you unanimously agree that to, that to cheat with the scales is worse, can you give me at least the source and the reason why? Huh? Avla. To lie, it's also avla. <laughs> it creates a lot of problems. I'm going to give you a hint. Do you remember a year ago I told you a story that... Do you remember a year ago 
I told you a story that uh, they wanted to pass a law in Israel, in the Knesset, that people that are almost dead, old, brain dead, you know, connected to all kinds of machines, or people that suffer in a hospital, that it will be legal to disconnect them from the machine or to choke them for a minute or two and help them to move to their next station, meaning send them away from the world. It's illegal in Israel. In some countries, maybe it's permitted. I don't know the laws of every country. But in Israel, it's 100% murder. It's called euthanasia. If they find a person who choked someone in a hospital, no matter how much he was suffering, they will press charges against him for murder. Most likely he won't get life in prison because he will prove that he did it for the sake of the person, he felt bad for his suffering, he will get three years in prison. Something like that. We'll make a deal. You got it, right? So it's illegal right now. They wanted to make it legal in Israel. And then the head of the doctors, a big liberal lefty, wicked guy, without saying his name, because I don't remember his name. <laughs> if I know his name, it's mitzvah to publish him. <laughs> he got up and said a speech. And thanks to his speech, they did not pass the law. Ah, usually lefties, they always vote for the wrong things in the eyes of God. You never find them vote for something positive. Only negative, abortion, they pro-abortion, gay marriage, they for it. It's taking money from the rich and give it to the bums who doesn't want to do anything with their life. They love it. Everything that Hashem hates, they love. How all of a sudden this lefty Bernie Sanders, the Israeli version, came up and gave a speech against it. We have to give him a little credit. This time he said the right thing. What did he say? He said... We are doctors in Israel who were trained and educate, educated and swore to do everything we can to save life. Mm -hmm. If we will now be the terminators, mm -hmm. we will start killing people because there's every day there's going to be at least one person in the hospital that needs to die because he's not going to come out of the hospital and he suffered. So we disconnect him for two minutes, and that's it. We move him to the cemetery. He catch a bed in a hospital. It costs money also. The family suffer going back and forth. There's a lot of issues. If we, the doctors that design to save lives, will also have another job to kill people, no one will ever trust us again. We will, we will be... Heroes and criminals at the same time. Heroes and criminals. Therefore, we would not, we do not want to be those who will do the job. It, did, it didn't, it wasn't against killing those people. It's for it. Don't get the wrong impression. Don't give him too much credit. <laughs> he wants them dead. But he didn't want the doctors to have to do it. For the sick people? No, for their reputation. It will hurt us in the long run. At least it was clever enough to see the future. This story reflects on the question I just asked you. What's worse, to lie or to cheat with the scale? Let's see who is clever. What's the comparison between the two cases? No? I'll give you a hint. What's worse? That a stranger will kill someone in a hospital? Not the doctor. Or that the doctor will choke him to death. If now people found out that some woman from the street came into the hospital, he saw someone suffer and he choked him. Or one of the doctors that works in the hospital did it. In the eyes of the public, when will they get much angrier? That somebody just did it? Or a doctor that works in the hospital did it? 
why the doctor will get people angrier? Because he's supposed to make Exactly, because the job of a doctor is to save life, not to terminate life. Same thing with the scale. Scale was designed to make justice, not the opposite of justice. So we're using the scale to deceive. It's using it for the opposite of the purpose that Hashem designed for it. It's a double crime. To lie, it's a crime. One crime. To deceive with a scale, it's two crimes. One is lie, and second is defeating the purpose what it was made for. It's two different crimes, so it's worse. That's why from all the examples that Chazal could have used for Eliezer, they called him a cheater with the scales. Why couldn't they just say deceiver? Why can't they just say liar? Why? They can found many, many names to describe that what he did was not kosher. No. They wanted to use the example of scales. Look how precise every word here in the Torah is. He wanted to go to his master. Why? But with the scale, because the scale, it's very easy to make a mistake. One side is positive, one side is negative. Eliezer was thinking, is it good that I suggest my daughter or not? Can I see it clearly? Am I objective? It's my daughter, I want the best for her. Will it be good for Yitzchak? I can see. I'm blinded. That's why the Torah says in another place, Ki ashochad ya'aver enech hachamim v'yisalef divrei tzadikim Bribe will blind the judges. It didn't say we'll turn the judges to liars. Crooks, they receive money under the table. They take the side of the criminal instead of the, of the righteous person. Why will they judge the opposite of the truth? They got a $100,000 suitcase yesterday. That's not what the Torah said. For this, you don't need Torah. Every fool knows it. You come to a judge, give him $100,000, I want you to dismiss my case. <laughs> no, big deal. Of course, if you took the suitcase, you know what's going to be tomorrow. For this, you need Torah. In Zimbabwe, in the jungles of Amazonas, those who never heard about the Torah, they don't know that if you give bribe to a judge, it will make the justice not fair. Everybody knows it. For this, you don't need Torah. That's not what the Torah claimed to say. The Torah says something different. The Torah says it will blind the judge. He won't be able to see who's right. From the minute this person gave him a gift, he already loves him. So everything the prosecutor say against him, get the judge angry. How do you talk like this against my friend who just donated to me $100,000? You're attacking my friend. I have to defend him. If you connect the, the judge to a lie detector after the trial, did you deceive in your verdict or no? Absolutely not. You're suspecting me? We want to take you to a lie detector. We want to check if you deceived. Did you receive bribe? You're suspecting me? I'm your honor. <laughs> okay, connect him to the machine. They, they ask him, did you actually rule against the truth? So I swear, absolutely not. That's the fair, the fair ruling. And the machine shows that he said the truth. If he was ruling against the truth, he wouldn't be able to pass the test. It will show that he lies. But if he, they ask the question, did you accept the bribe? Then, then they will catch him. Did you accept the bribe? He cannot lie. But they will ask him, did you rule... Honestly, he would say yes, and the machine shows that he's not lying. Why? Because in his mind, he made fair judgment. Why? Because he cannot see negative in a defendant. That's what happened with the lefty liberal prosecutors in Israel. 
They hate the religion so much. So automatically, every time there is a subject that relates to religion, they can't even see that it's positive. Even if they themselves say to their wife in a kitchen, this is what should be done, the fact that the rabbi now came to the court and said it, immediately they against it. Why? Or the other way around. If it's a religious judge, and a righteous person came and say it, even though he was normally not so much for it, right now, because he liked the guy, he immediately uh, he adapted. Because we don't, I always say, you have to pay attention to what was, what was told to you, not who told you, what was told. If an antisemite guy would tell you something against the Jews, or against you, as a Jew, that he, he walks with you in the office and insulted you, automatically you reject what he say. Shame on you, you Nazi. But maybe it's possible that what he told you is true. Yeah, he hates Jews. He didn't tell it to you because he loves you. He wanted to get you. But the question now, when he came to insult you and put you down, what he told you, it's true or not? You can see. Why? Because you hate him. You can't see, you cannot let him rebuke you. You can't be impartial. Exactly. That's why a Rebbe, a good Rebbe, if he wants to succeed with a student in yeshiva, first rule is to make the kids love him. Once the kid loves him, he can always take them to the side and talk to them. They're willing to do for him because they love him. If he will rule them like a dictator and make them all hate him, it doesn't really matter if he will say the truth, they will all hate him. Why? Because they resent everything he said. That's why when you rebuke, there is a rule. You must start with all the positive you can say to the person. You don't right away tell him, listen, I saw you stealing. I saw you. You don't start like that. So listen, um, can I talk to you? Yeah. You know, you're a great guy. I know you for years. Baruch Hashem, you're very religious. You're such a good husband and a father. I see how you are with your kids. What does it have to do with the stealing? Nothing. You just make friendship now. Because you're not friends with him. You want to rebuke him. You have to create friendship. Otherwise, he won't accept from you. It's a waste of time. You donate so much money to the shul, to the yeshiva. I heard so many wonderful things about Why are you telling me all these things? You want to marry my daughter? <laughs> no, no, no. Don't worry. I'm married already. So what's the problem? <laughs> Today when you compliment a person too much, they immediately begin to think, what's the catch? Because no one can accept love today with such a horrible world we live in. So, but in a normal world that people complimented each other for the sake of heaven, not for personal gain. So you come and say to him, you know, I admire you, I learned so much from you and this. But uh, can I make uh, one little comment? Of course, ma, you're my brother, ma, after all this speech. I saw you taking something that it's not really yours. I mean, you know, should have paid for it. Mm. Oh, yeah, you're right. I don't know what got into my head. Don't worry, it won't happen again. You understand me, right? Of course, brother, thank you. Can I get a hug? <laughs> but if you come to me and listen, Camiro, I saw exactly what you did. Who do you think you are? You, you faker. You're walking with this yamaka on your head? Should I tell everyone what you just did? Will he ever accept from you? He wants to kill you. If he could kill you, he would kill you right now. So to rebuke, it's not easy. You need to know how to do it. Just before we finish, Rabotai, when we say vidui, we say Hashem no, we make confession, Bagad no, Gazal no, one of the things we say is we gave bad advice, but that's already included in Kizavnu. Kizavnu means we deceived. You give someone a bad advice, it's deceiving, tricking him. Why do we need to say Yatsnu etzotraot? The answer means, it means we gave an advice that cannot be proven as a lie. Because everything we say according to the technical side, it's the truth. But we had a hidden agenda. <coughs> the 
that's why it's Yaatsnu et Sotraot. Like the one who told him, why do you want to move to Israel? You know how many challenges? What's in his mind? The challenges? I want to stay here. 1,500 a month, I'm going to have to hire another Melamed. <laughs> you get it or no, Rabotai? Eliezer came with the camels, Rivka came, she gives water to the camel, she's such a balat chesed, unbelievable. Very nice. You find a very kind girl. Modest, everyone was modest. You don't really have to check modesty. Women never heard about uh, bathing suit in those days, and, you know, everyone was covered. So what do you need in a woman now? What do you need in a woman? And this is the last thing for tonight. We'll take five, ten minutes and we'll finish. What's more important? Yeah. If you have a woman with wonderful personality but rotten ideology, parents send her to Harvard, <laughs> Columbia, Yale, and another poison house, <laughs> and twisted her mind, she hates religion, she's not so much for rabbis, but she's a wonderful person. She's very polite, kind, generous, honest, even modest. She has very good personality. She's merciful. She doesn't lie. Very, very much impressive girl. Intelligent. But horrible ideology. Meaning, what do we need religion for? A woman has the right to do whatever she feels like with her body, meaning she's pro-abortion. Not because she's a murderer, this girl. I just say she's a very good girl. Because they brainwash her in a university that a woman has the right to decide. A man cannot tell her not to abort. Ah, if you show her a one-hour film, what a horrible murder it is to chop a baby with a knife to pieces and vacuum his pieces, when you stick it to his head and neck just because she doesn't want to have a child because she didn't plan now. She's only 35. It's too early. Ah, she's gonna change her mind because she's a good person. If she's evil, doesn't matter whatever you show her, she's still selfish. She doesn't care about the baby. But if she's a good person, she's good to everyone. She, want, she would see that is a clear murder she would change her mind. In Israel, they did a test for three days. Every woman already signed and agreed for abortion. Once she came already to the hospital to do it, they put a microphone on her stomach and she heard in the speaker the pulse of the baby. Ta -tam, ta -tam, ta -tam, ta -tam, ta -tam. She said, what's this? She said, it's the pulse of your baby. Uchai, he's alive? What did you think? Is plastilina? What is he? <laughs> It's a piece of shit rock or, or maybe uh, mud? What, what, what is, what did you, uh, they told me it's nothing. It's the third month of the pregnancy. Yeah, it's the size of a cookie. But, 100% alive. Ta -tam, ta -tam, ta -tam. Right away, the majority of them got up. Give me the paper. I'm not doing it. Why they don't do it all the time? Because the lefty liberals are getting angry. You abuse the women. Don't do that. Why? We try to prevent a murder. We live in Saddam. People that make the laws are Saddamized people. The last thing they care about is murdering two million babies. You know, that's the amount of babies they murder officially in Israel. In the first seven years since Israel became a state, two million babies, it's one million families. Today, third or fourth generation would be 50 million Jews. Our heart is totally smashed and broken from 1,200 deceased people and another 250 kidnapped. Almost 1,500 people together with the soldiers that died, 44, and roughly about 1,500 victims of this horrible terror attack. And for, for a month and a half, all of us are depressed and broken. None of us is broken for more than 50 million Jews who were washed down the drain 
in the state of Israel. 50 million. We cry about 1,500. And we smile about 50 million. And then we worry about Iran will have a bomb or not. Hezbollah will shoot or not. Hamas will do or not. Stuyot. Rabbi, vaccine is life risk. Of course it's life risk. To one person save life, the other person will kill him. But if you saw righteous, and you so worry about people's life, where were you all these years when they murdered two million babies? When there's no doubt that is a hundred percent murder. Vaccine maybe will kill you, maybe will save you. Or maybe will do nothing. It's still in a matter of argument. Obviously, millions of people got it in Israel, and not all of them dead. So, there are people who are still alive. Tov, Baruch Hashem. So it's still a questionable, questionable matter. But these people who are so devoted to save life, where are they when they're murdering every day dozens of babies in Israel? Every day. Hundreds. Do the math. Two million in seven years. How many is that every year? How many is that every day? Do the math. It's many. Many deaths every day. Much more than what the Hamas or any other murderers killed. Even in the Holocaust, we had a few million Jews dead. We didn't reach even 5% of how many we killed with our own hands in the state of Israel. Oh, you don't want the baby? Give him to adoption. Until 20, 25 years ago, 15% of the women and men could not have kids. Give them kids. Why do they have to import some uh, goim from Brazil? Give them a Jewish kid. You don't want him. Tough. You're young. You're not married. Your boyfriend committed a sin with you. You have a baby. Give him for adoption. Why to murder him? You will kill two stones with one rock. First, you don't become a murderer, and second, you help a couple that cannot have kids. And you bring a Jewish soul to the world, at least someone will come to the world without killing him. So, forever we're going to speak and complain about the Nazis, and we have all the rights to complain, of course. But why we don't complain about our Nazi act? If the Nazis will do to us exactly what we did to those babies, the Nazis put everyone in a room and gas them. Between me and you, what's worse? To put a person in a room and put gas until a minute later he falls and dies because he cannot breathe? It's like drowning, basically, in the water. Or to take a knife and stick it 5,000 times to him and then vacuum him into a vacuum cleaner. That's an abortion. Like this. They put their hands inside. It's called greda. Greda means to scratch. You know, you have a scrape, scrape, to scrape. That's the right word. And you know what they do? I saw a lecture from a baby doctor from Mexico in one of the seminars with presentation. 500 people sit in a seminar, and then he shows like a puzzle. A little head, little hands, legs like this. Tiny, very tiny, it's small. It's the six months, seven months, it's very small. Not even a pound. And he say, you know what's this? That's what they do after they finish the abortion to make sure they didn't forget anything inside. Mm -hmm. So they put all the pieces together. When they see a complete thing, they dump it. Then he showed two big buckets like this, huge garbage bags, full of organs of babies that they chop to pieces. And he said, you know what's this? Everyone is in shock. The women are crying, because you know how it is. There are women in the audience that made an abortion once or twice or three times with a horrible lifestyle they live. And now it hit them for the first time what they've done. They, never, they were not aware of it. When you don't think, you're not aware of what you are doing. And when, they showed it, when he showed the two big garbage things like this with Tons of, hundreds of pounds of organs like this. He said, what's this? He said, all the pieces from the abortion that they do every week there in the hospital. What are they doing with this? One person asked. He said, they sell it to China. 
Why? The Chinese eat it. That's what he said. I, ne I would never dream such thing. That's what he said. The speaker is a, is a famous doctor and also righteous. They eat it. Well, after you see, they eat cockroaches and worms and dogs. Everything is possible. It breaks the heart. It breaks the heart. This is all the lefty liberals. Look how much we suffer from them. Look. They are the ones who keep pushing it. I want to tell you a story. There was a, there was a member in the Knesset. His name was Shmuel Tamir. 30 years ago. One time he brought a, a law to the Knesset to approve, to make abortion legal. Right now, until then, they did it in private clinics. <coughs> he wanted to make it completely legal. Nobody has to, to go to a committee, no investigation, nobody asks you why you want to abort. You go, and they do it for you in the hospital. Like, just, just like to give you a shot. That's it. In the middle of the arguments in the Knesset, one religious man came to him and whispered something to his ear. His name is Rabbi Porush. He said to him, can I tell you a story? He said, yes. He said, 45 years ago, a woman wanted to make an abortion. She already paid the doctor and made a, an appointment. When she was already ready to go and do it, one religious rabbi came and begged her not to abort and told her, I'll give you money, I'll, I'll do whatever you want, I'll help you to raise the kid, please do not kill him. And she agreed not to kill the baby. And that baby was you. Wow. And the rabbi who convinced the wife not to do it was my father. He said, come on, you and your nonsense. Why are you telling me this story? He said, call your mother, ask. In the middle of the argument in the Knesset, he's the one who pushing it. He called up his mother, tell me, this story is true? Yeah. She said, yes. That rabbi convinced you not to do it? Yes, I was very much into it. Thanks to him, you came to the world. He said, I'm canceling my... My, my law, we wanted to pass the law. I'm canceling this. It's just to show you that in the end, it all comes down to personal feelings and interest. What change? The truth is the same truth. Ah, but now when it became his matter, how can I suggest such a thing when I myself came to the world Thanks to anti-abortion activists. Rabotai, Rabotai, listen to this. She gives water to all the camels. Why the Torah has to tell us about the camel now? Who cares about the camels now? Tell us a whole story that she said, let me give also water to your camel. So the Torah wanted to show us that she was very much, she was very kind more than the average. She could have said to him, here is the water, do it. I, I'm, not your, I'm not your worker. Even though I was standing there, let me also give to your camels. What's special about the word gamal? Camel in English come from the word gamal in the Lashon HaKodesh. What's so special about the Gamal? What's the meaning of the word Gamal? Gamal means to pay back. To pay someone back. Someone did you a favor, uh, two months later he needs a favor, you pay him back. Why did you come to help me? Because you helped me two months ago. How can I say no? That's called Gomel. When someone is kind, how do you call him in the language of the Torah? Gomel Hasadim. Gomel Hasadim. Gomel means payback. But you never did anything to me. I just did you a favor for the first time. I owe you nothing. Why I'm considered Gomel Hasadim? If you did a favor to me and I pay you back, that's Gomel Hasadim. You did Chesed, I return Chesed. But if it's the first time I see you, you're stuck in the highway. I stopped. Do you need help? Yeah, I have flat tire. 
I don't know what to do, let me help you. Shh. You come, you fix, you put the tire. Wow, thank you so much. How is this person called? Gomel Chasadim. Like we said at Fila, Gomel Chasadim Tovim. But Hashem give us kindness even when we don't deserve it. We didn't earn it most of the time. Gomel Chasadim, free Chesed. So why we call Hashem Gomel Chasadim? We should have say Chasid. Ose Chasadim. Why Gomel? Gomel means to return. Ose Chasadim is doing Chesed. You understand the question or no? Because the only time and the only way to do an act of chesed correctly is when the person you're doing him a favor will never be ashamed of it. You make him feel that you owe him. I owe you, you know how much you inspired me I'm honored. Wow, you give me this chut. Thank you so much for helping me to help you. I'm not helping you. I owe you. What do you owe me? Well, I didn't do anything for you. No, no, believe me. I see how you come, how you pray every morning. He gives me inspiration. Believe me, I owe you a lot more. He make up a... Why? If you come to him, listen, you don't deserve it, but I'm going to help you anyway. <laughs> you make him feel like garbage. Can't sleep at night. Why are you so upset? He saved you. Yeah, but he had to say this to me. Punched me. You know, pinched me in my, in my stomach. But when you say to him, wow, I'm so honored. I had such a schut. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the merit to help, to do. Thanks to you, I get a Baruch Hashem. Hashem will have mercy on you. It makes you feel great that you receive help. Do you understand? What's the best way? You can give charity to a poor person. But there's a better way. Say to him, I have a job a little bit in my house. I got a closet from uh, Ikea, whatever, one of these places. I'm not so good. I'm not a handyman. I heard you know how to put things together. Can you come help me? I'll pay you for that. Of course. How much you pay him? It's an hour work. How much you pay a worker in New York today? $20 an hour. You give him 100 it doesn't, it's not a hundred dollar job. You only work 45 minutes. Pay him like a lawyer almost. <laughs> the old do the closet for me was all an excuse. You wanted to give him a hundred dollar to help him out. You know he's poor. You wanted to give him 500. But you, you know it's a person that doesn't like to receive help financially. So you created for him something to do. Can you help me painting? He worked three, four hours, give him a thousand dollars. He could have given it to him without the job. But he will feel guilty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you make him work a little bit and you give him some. Why should I pay you less than a lawyer? You're a Bachur Yeshiva. I should give you less than a crook lawyer from Manhattan that all day lie and deceive? If I pay him $600 an hour, I have to pay you at least 1000 Listen, but I'm a Bachur Yeshiva. But he doesn't deserve the dirt on, on the sole of your toe. And I have to pay him $600 an hour to represent me in court. Or to my accountant. They're not even Shomer Shabbat. Everything they say, it's a lie. They care about me. They care about their pocket. The last thing they care about is the client. It's all about how can I get more money. That's why divorce cases by them never end. They'll stretch it as long as they can take the last penny from you. They don't want to finish it. The longer it takes, the more money they make. But why so many people suffer, the kids? They don't care about the kids. They don't care about their stomach. So you, Bachur Yeshiva, reviving the whole world. Thanks to you, we are alive. You did a job for me for an hour, and I'm going to pay you less than this crook. But how many Jews like this you know? When the Bachur Yeshiva come, they give him 30 bucks. Can I make you a sandwich, Moshe? 30 bucks. Like uh, the people who stand on the street looking for a job. If people would follow the Torah, they would give him a huge amount of money. Huge. Why? Not for him, for the Torah. I want him to sit and learn Torah, have a peace of mind, have a few hundred in his pocket. 
This is my opportunity to support Torah. You should also know when you go to a wedding, you give a gift. Whatever the average gift. Let's say you and your wife give normally $300 when you go to a wedding. Let's say. Now you have a wedding of a Bachur Yeshiva. Not fancy. It's not a Bukharian wedding. You don't have seven floors. Not even one floor. What do you have? Sweet cucumbers with some onion, chala, chicken soup from the time of Antiochus, white chicken, if you're lucky, piece of kugel, Baruch Hashem, Shtabach Shemot, $12, the old meal. They didn't spend 150000 on flowers, the wedding gowns from the Gmach. Let's say it's not the type of wedding that you're going to gain weight tonight. <laughs> Now you come, you think, how much I cost them, me and my wife? 100 bucks, the most. How much should I give? $1,000. When I go to the fancy wedding, I cover my cost, let's say. That's my rule, let's say. Whatever I know, more or less I cost, I pay. But when I go to a wedding of a Bachur Yeshiva, I'm going to give three, four times more. Not because the wedding was expensive, no. Because I want to donate to the Bachur Yeshiva. Now the question is, can you take it off your maaser? The answer is, this is how it works. What you normally would give a gift to a wedding like this? Very simple, cheap wedding. You're going with your wife, let's say you give $200, let's say. And now you give a thousand, the 800 extra, you can deduct 100% from your master as a donation to Talmud Yeshiva. And actually it's better to give it this way because he doesn't get embarrassed. I did a wedding, it's normal that people give gifts. I don't give usually a thousand dollars, but he doesn't know that you gave him only because it's Bachur Yeshiva. For him it's a gift. But you had in mind to donate to him a lot because he's a Bachur Yeshiva. What if he's some kind of a bum? All day, happy hour, you know? He also have a little yamaka, like the Prime Minister, you know, that tiny quarter. No, what, what would you do? You have to be a fool to give him an extra penny. Give what it costs, that's it. Every other dollar is a waste of money. It's like burning your money. What is he going to do with that? Going to learn Torah with that? What is he going to do? Send his kids to the best yeshivot? Buy gemarot that he can sit and learn day and night? Usually that's not what they do. So you have to know where to invest, Rabotai. And I keep repeating it because people are not getting the point. So Gamal, Rabotai, why they call Gamal, Gamal? Listen carefully now. In Perek Shira, it's written, Gamal Omer, the camel, every animal have a statement. What's the statement of the camel? Hashem imarom ishag. Hashem is shouting from heaven. And he sends his voice from his house up there. He screams on his house, meaning the temple. The Bet HaMikdash. That's why the temple is destroyed, because instead of killing us, he killed his house. He threw his anger on wood and stones. So that's what the camel says. Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zatzal, says, all the animals, when they come to attack, they want to eat. Why animals attack each other? For one reason, to eat, not to die. Just to eat. To survive. It's a survival war. So when the animal comes to attack, they all come very quiet. The leopard. Shh. Very, very quiet. The fox, when he comes to the chicken, very, very, very quiet. Very quiet. And that's when they got to a position that can attack, boom, they jump. But in the, in, the, in the whole process, it's very, very quiet. Why? They deceive their prey. Until it's too late to run. The camel is the opposite. He makes a lot of noise when he comes to attack. He makes noise. 
Why is a tzaddik? He learned the Rambam in Ilchot Melachim, the laws of Melachim, Rambam in the sixth book from the six ones. Halacha, the seventh provision. It says like this. When you attack a city, to capture a city, you now want to go into a war against Gaza according to the laws of God. Not the Israeli army or Benny Gantz or Bibi. According to God, the laws of the, of the divine laws, it's written in the Rabbah, how you make a war against your enemies. Even for that you have laws. Why do you think, you just take a gun or a knife and you go and kill? No, no, no. So, the Rambam writes, When you attack a city, to capture the city, to occupy the city, you don't come from all four directions. You leave them one side to run away, push them back. You don't want to kill them first. That's not the first priority. You come from one side, left, right, and from the front. What about the back? Let them run, like the Israelis did now. Run to the south of Gaza. We won't attack you. We can kill all of you. No. We rather that you run. Why? We don't have a war with you. We have a war with these Nazis, Hamas Nazis. Run. We could have ambushed Gaza from all directions and butchered all of them. Actually, that would be a one-day job. Not 45 days so far. One-day job, just dumping, killing every building with people, with civilians, everyone dead, and that's it. By the time you finish in one, two days, you have a million people dead or more. And there's not one house left and they will run anyway. But that's not the way we do it. We are not Nazis like them. We want the civilians to go, even though I'm telling you 100% there's almost no civilians there. Everyone there is a terrorist, everyone is happy when Jews are killed, they dance, they give candy, they're very happy. When they burn the woman, you saw how they were all clapping when she's going on fire. Women, go, lo, 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 lo. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Happy to see a woman is getting burned alive. When they see how they, whatever other things they did to the woman, you have to see how many people came and I was so happy. There's no difference between the one who shot and the one who clapped yeah, and the one who gives candies. Everyone is a Nazi. Everyone. I want to remind you that 65% of them vote for the Hamas. What about the other 35%? Either they did not vote or they vote for Abu Mazen, Abu Mazen another terrorist. A little bit less. That's it. Also denied the Holocaust, also wants all Jews dead. Also a terrorist. Student of Arafat. So Rabotai, the Rambam writes, you give them one direction that they can run. You only ambush them from three directions. You allow them to run for their life. We learn it from God's instructions to Moshe in a war against Midian. From here we learn, you do not... You do not do everything you can to kill them. You rather that they escape. And that's what the camel does. The camel that is feeling threatened by another, by another animal, he, when he wants to attack that animal, he makes a lot of noise. Why? He rather the animal would run. He doesn't really want to kill them. That's why they call him Gamal. Meaning Gamal is Gomel Hasadim. We have a bird that's called Hasida. Hasida from the word Chesed. Hasida, why the Gemara say why the name of the Hasida is Hasida? Because it does act of kindness with her friends. So why it's not a kosher animal? Most of the birds are kosher. But Hasida is not kosher. Why? If Hasidah is kind and does act of charity, 
Why wouldn't it, it Hasida is not uh, attacking and, and, and murdering and, and other birds like the eagle or other birds? Hasida, it's a uh, gentle. It should have been. It should have been kosher. Other birds that are not murderers are kosher. But Hasida, exceptionally, it's not kosher. Especially when you call the Hasida. What does it mean, Hasid? Someone that does chasadim, chesed, act of kindness. But something is not kosher about the chasidah. The chasidah is racist, <laughs> prejudiced, racist. Is willing to, and she's willing to help only her own kind. What are you? I'm Satmer. You Satmer? No, I'm uh, Vishnitz. <laughs> Go to Vishnitz to help you. What are you? I'm Tzanz. Why you came to me? I'm Bobov. <laughs> okay, now there are two Bobov. Which Bobov you are? This one or that one? That one. Go over there. Who are you? I'm Sfaradi. Why you came to me? Go to the Moroccan rabbi. I came to him, but you're not Halabi. Why you came here? And I will finish with a beautiful story. Most people are not like that. They help all Jews. Doesn't matter. Sfaradi, Ashkenazi, Hasid. Someone will come to me. The last thing I care about, what kind of a Jew he is. This kind or that kind, or Hungarian or Russian or Moroccan or Yemenite. Shtuyot, only a fool is thinking this way. And makes Hashem very angry. The Hasidah is not willing to help other birds. Only our own kinds. That's when Hashem says, you're not kosher in my eyes. You're, you're an impure bird. Why? But I do kindness all the time. But not to everyone. You're a racist. I cannot stand racist. I have a friend. Baruch Hashem, I had the school to make him Baal Tshuva many years ago. Listen to this story. You'll love it. He, you know, he's working. He makes a living. But, you know, not enough. Lots of people struggle now. It's hard to pay the bills. So one time, someone told him, go to the Gmach of the Syrian people. Syrian, you know, Baruch Hashem, they have a lot of uh, foundation, they help people, they help people to send kids to yeshivot, which is a very big mitzvah. A lot of rich millionaires here. They give money, and people that come, they show they have low income, and this, they want their kids to go to yeshiva. They don't want them to go to public school, so they help. So he came to a place, and they gave him a nice amount of help. But listen, they have thousands of people. They can't give full tuition, so they help a little bit. You have a thousand, two thousand to every person. After he proves that he's a needy. The year after, this person went to a shul in Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, I don't remember, one of those two days. And someone said, I want to sell this aliyah, the price is $4,000. And looked at him. No, buy it. <laughs> I said to him, I'm not rich. How can I pay $4,000? Buy it. Show Hashem you trust him. Don't be afraid. You'll get it back. The guy is telling me another story. He said, I don't know, like a fool. I said, okay, $4,000. He said, sold. <laughs> sold. Then I, he said to me, then I started to think, how exactly I'm paying this? He said, no, no, worry. you can pay it in payments. You have a year to pay. Divided to 12 payments. He's thinking to myself, okay, you taught me about a lot of, about the faith and confidence in Hashem. I said, it's time to prove that I have confidence in Hashem. This guy have one wonderful thing about him. He's a very honest person, very honest, and he does not speak one word in a shul besides praying. Nothing, not after davening, not in between. Not even when he walk into the synagogue at 2 p.m. to take something and someone is inside talking to him, he doesn't speak. He doesn't say one word in the house of God besides praying oh. or Torah. So now he needs to go and apply for help for his children to go to yeshiva for the, for the next year. They told him, go to this Syrian gmach. There is one rabbi is in charge of the money. He's going to make you fill up the paper. He's going to make an interview with you. And then he will decide how much to send you. He said to me, I'm going to the place. 
People wait online, they called my name. You write your name, they called my name. I walk inside, I see it's a shul. The, guy, the rabbi is sitting inside the shul to interview the people. I went inside, he said to me, what's your name? I said, mm, ma, mm. <laughs> He said, I went like this to him. Let's talk outside. He didn't understand what I want. I mean, he's doing you a favor. Now you're telling me, come outside. You came for help, no? Mm -hmm, mm, 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 mm. He said to him, mm, 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 mm. you know, like this, five, ten minutes. Mm, mm, mm. He's thinking to my, he said to me, I already knew my chance to get money out of this guy is probably went down to zero. But I made myself a promise. I never say a word in a synagogue. Now, this particular gmach, the maximum they ever give to a person is 1,000. And that's someone that is really a needy. The maximum. So, okay, that's also help. You can get a little help. <laughs> he said to me, I wrote down my information on the form before. Before he go, they make you fill up the form, and then they call you. I gave him the form. I said, Mama. I went outside. No problem. When he went outside, he said to him, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't talk inside of the shul. Forgive me, nothing personal. And he left. He said, a week later, he called up the place. Hi, I'm the one who came. Remember me, I, I'm the one who didn't speak in the shul. I'm sorry, you know. Oh, don't worry, we'll mail you a check. You should have it any day. He said to me, I get an envelope. I open it up. What was the amount? The answer is obvious, $4,000. He said, I called up the person who referred me to that gmach. He said to me, you're not going to believe. You told me the maximum they give is 1000 They sent me 4000 He said to me, it has to be a mistake. Trust me, people who don't have what to eat, the maximum they can get there is 1000 <laughs> So he said to me, you see how I, I bought that aliyah? Hashem sent me back the aliyah. I was thinking to myself, why that Syrian rabbi in charge of the Gemach sent him 4,000? Because he was a smart Jew. I would have done the same thing. Why? When you see a person that needs money, and needs your help, and he does not agree to talk about his problem because inside the shul, when he needs you, okay, just now I'm going to talk. I usually don't talk, but now I'm in an interview to get help. It's pikuach nefesh. He saw that that Jew is a man of the truth. No matter what, needs money not, he's still not going against his minag. That's why he sent him four times than what he sent to others. This is the kind of Jews we have in the world. Baalei Tshuva came out of, from a from a world they didn't know that much, and they become more righteous than people that were born religious all their life. Not to say one word in a synagogue ever. Not only with the tefillin. Some people with the tefillin they don't speak until they take it off. Okay, it's also very nice. Some people in the middle of davening they don't speak. Even in the times when you're allowed to speak, but in the shul they don't speak. But when they finish, they fold the talit tefillin. People have conversation in a shul. They don't wait until they go to the parking. <sighs> That's different kinds of levels. To be in such a level when you need the money and not to break your devotion, that's a great thing. This is a moment of inspiration. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen. Amen.